October 11th, 2023 to order. And I will go ahead and lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, just a housekeeping note that our president, um, Catherine Costling, is attending virtually. That's what the laptop on the desk is for. So thank you. Um, on to item 1.3, I will invite Ms. Hillman to recognize some of our Austining students for their participation in the 1000 Book Project. Uh, is Ms. Hillman. Thank you, Ms. Hillman. <laughs> um, this is our equity item on the agenda. And so, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. You can go, Ms. Hellman. Thank I'm you. I'm reading my script, I got a little off. <laughs> Thanks. So thanks for giving me a few minutes tonight to honor seven children and their families for reading 1,000 books together. These children tonight range in age from three and a half, although that one's home in bed because it's bedtime. So he'll be picking up his awards tomorrow from Claremont School as well, uh, all the way up to eight years old. So this is one of my favorite things to do um, each year. Unfortunately, last year with timing and, and different things, I wasn't able to get to um, a meeting to celebrate families. So tonight we're here celebrating seven families that completed the project since the summer of 2022. The Austining Staff Development Center actually began the Thousand Books Project with 100 bags of 10 over at the Austining Library. And it's kind of changed and, and shifted over the years. And now the library keeps track of all the record keeping. And the children have a choice of the books that they want to read. So it's kind of awesome that they pick 1,000 books of their liking um, and read throughout the time that it takes them to read the books. But um, the library does honor them, but we didn't want to stop the fun there since we have t-shirts and books that we like to share and acknowledge the children who read. So I would like to call each of them up and I'm going to present them with a book, a t-shirt, and a pencil. So when I call your name, come on up and stand over here and wave and say hello. Um, we have, so we have Gideon who's not here because he's three and a half and it's his bedtime. Um, Aiden, come on up. All right, and Caroline. Esther. That's for you. Congratulations. Henry. And you, God. So let's give them all a round of applause. And I just wanted to finish by saying that there's a popular quote out there. Children are made readers on the laps of their parents. And I'd paraphrase it to include any special person who's helping to instill a love of reading in children. It's never too early to start reading with a child. And we have our Austin Public Library, as well as so many other resources available to help foster and support early reading habits um, here in Austin. So while your children may only sit on your laps for a certain amount of time to read and before they just don't want to anymore. I wish you thousands of more opportunities to read to and with your children. And I know that there's going to be thousands of more books that they'll read in the years to come. So congratulations to all of you. Give yourselves a big round of applause. And thank you again for your time. Yeah, if, you, if, if the kids want to stay there for just a second, if the kids can stay for just a yeah. second and parents want to come up and take a picture awesome. before we move on. You, want, you guys want to stay right here and we'll get some pictures? 
Or have we already dissipated? It's too late. <laughs> Let the, let the parents get a, their Kodak moment. you and congratulations to the to all of the students uh, recognized this evening we love to see children grow into enthusiastic readers um, to our families who are here you are of course welcome to stay um, but we will not be offended if you choose now to be the time that you make your exit um, <clears throat> moving on the first item on our work session agenda is item 2.1 the superintendent's update so at this time uh, let me turn things over to Ms. Fox Alter Hi, uh, good evening everybody and welcome, welcome. So I just have a couple of quick shout outs to do before I introduce the uh, main presentation for this evening. Um, I wanna thank everybody who made our Spirit Week memorable, um, Twin Day, Barbie Day and more, the successful pep rally. Um, the rain didn't dampen the spirits of all of our students and staff. I wanna thank Austin Matters for a successful um, um, uh, 5K, 2K walk run fundraiser and for raising an incredible, wait for it, $20,000. So that's phenomenal. I, I want to give a big shout out. Thank you to Maria Myers who uh, represented us at the event. It was rescheduled and then it moved a little earlier because of the weather. But again, thank you, Maria, for, for being there and helping out. Thanks, Alita, for it. By the way, again, the messages went out about the free um, breakfast and lunch for all. Um, we really appreciate that. Everyone is getting a copy of the Security and Safety new brochure. It's no longer just a newsletter. It's a very friendly, easy-to-read brochure. Please check it out. And I want to thank um, the um, Claremont, who held their first student spirit leader meeting this week. Uh, we have a lot packed. We have an ENL parent info night taking place. AMD rehearsals for Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Check it out. Please save the date for December 7th and 8th at 7 p.m. And I, uh, we had our high school students today, a big marathon effort, even though there was a national outage with the college board. It was PSAT. Uh, testing day, but uh, everyone helped out with our uh, high school students. This, this process, the college application process, some of us were having a conversation earlier. It can be a rather stressful period, and it certainly didn't help that the, uh, the nationally the uh, PSATs went down, but our students rallied, our teachers rallied, and it went off uh, well after that. So I want to thank everyone for lifting for that. So uh, tonight, I'm just going to go up to the podium for this. Um, I just need to give a huge shout out to, first of all, to a, uh, my seven bosses, the Board of Education of the Ossining Union Free School District, and for their time in meeting with me it, as part of my onboarding here. They wanted to have an approach that pretty much aligned to this terrific Austining uh, long-range plan in a way that was strategic and meaningful, that aligned conversations about the work we're doing to commit at the beginning of the year, to have data presented as, as part of our ongoing conversation, and again, in a way that's impactful and meaningful and relevant, and for a board and then the community, of course, to see a comprehensive approach towards curriculum uh, instruction and assessment, which is what we're all about. So with that uh, leap of faith, I have to give a huge shout out to the administrative team who basically just kept on saying, okay, Mary, okay, how are we going about it? So we revamped uh, the entire, uh, their long range plans, uh, which the board has. And tonight I'm just gonna give an overview of your Austining Rises, now my Austining Rises, our Austining Rises long-term range plan. 
So long-term plans are uh, fundamentally a wonderful tool to use when you're trying to do long-term goals in a very strategic, organized, and dedicated way. So much put together in the Ossining Rises document, and I took that document and aligned it to what I was trained in, not only by the state education department, but by um, an organization that does this type of work for school districts throughout the United States and for companies. So in this, you start your work every day with this vision, this clear vision as to what you want things to be. You want to ensure that you are a model education system that puts equity in the forefront. Educators, family, and community members working in partnership with all students to ensure that they graduate with a deep passion for lifelong learning and making the world a better place. That's a phenomenal vision statement. I want to congratulate the community and the teachers and many of the task force members who put that together. That vision is based upon some core beliefs, beliefs that really integral a fundamental values of this community and this school district. It's your ethical code, your overriding convictions, your principles, and your bedrock absolutes. You believe that educational equity ensures that each and every learner has the skills and resources needed to achieve their personal best in every classroom, school, and building students are to experience. Beliefs, mindsets, and practices grounded in equity, emotionally, intellectually, and physically safe environments, culturally relevant and rigorous instruction, connectedness and belonging, and environments where the needs of each and every learner are known and met. This is our core belief. They are based on a set of core values to provide a diverse and innovative learning environment, promote a holistic approach to education through arts, academics, and athletics, and teach the life lessons focused on compassion, kindness, and empathy. And boy, do we need that now. Based on all of that, this school community created a mission statement for the current work. Your mission statement ensures excellence for all students. The Ossining School District recognizes the value and the importance of family, school, and community partnerships in educating all students. You place emphasis on high standards, quality instruction, and significant pupil achievement because all students can and will learn. You hold high expectations for every single individual student. You educate every child to his or her potential, recognizing individual student needs. You provide equal opportunities, expecting equitable outcomes for all, and fostering respect and appreciation for both individual differences and cultural diversity, and prepare students for informed and active participation as responsible citizens in our American democracy. A wonderful mission statement. Okay. As part of that now, you have to have, you created your vision, your long term. You created, you recognize the values of which it's built into. You drafted a mission statement. Now, with that mission statement, what are your strategic objectives with that? What are your objectives? They are personified in the portrait of a learner. Each student will provide, be provided with a roadmap to success. Each student will acquire the personal and academic skills to be successful, and each student will experience an educational pathway that creates strong and capable thinkers and problem solvers. And the visual for that, with more granular information, is a document that sits and lives and breeds in every classroom and every office here in this school district. With that, now you have to have goals. You have objectives, what are your goals? The goals are four. They are bold resolutions that dedicate the district's resources and energies towards continuous creation of systems to achieve the extraordinary results. 
They are strategic. Your goals have to be strategic because they serve to unite and engage stakeholders, to elevate equity, inclusiveness, and individual identity for the well-being of every student. We celebrate and empower student academic endeavors and embrace the whole child by pursuing these goals with passion, skill, innovation, and determination. And every single building level ac um, action plan are built upon these four pillars, every single one of them. And you will see in the building's action plans that they will check off in, the, in their individual boxes which one of these pillars the thoughtful and mindful work that the schools are doing addresses underneath. Your four pillars, multiple liter literacies, relevance and student choice, social, emotional and learning, and family and community engagement. Right? And again, this is just a visualization of the four pillars of every action that the school district will embark upon this year. You need areas of focus that are shared, understood, and reportable, measurable through. The four areas of focus that this school district is working on this year, and that's what you're going to hear this evening from our fabulous um, elementary leadership team here, are data literacy, small group instruction, equity, and family and community partnerships. What they're presenting tonight is their commitment to work in those four areas aligned to the goals and will be able to report out to you individual work that they're doing in each of the schools to address each of those four areas. And they're going to speak about how are they going to measure that work? What's the evidence they're going to gather that this work took place and that this work had impact on it? Right? And it's an important conversation to have because to whet your appetite for a meeting later on this fall, we will be talking specifically about the data, all kinds of data, austening by the numbers. In the spring, this team will come back on two separate nights and then report back out on the year. How did it work? How did each of our action plans turn out? What were the gaps? Where did we need to improve and what was a success? They're going to give an update on all the evidence as statements as to why this work worked and why they believe that it did or did not work. And you will hear woven in through it when they speak about the evidence, uh, qualitative uh, evidence such as interviews and anecdotal pieces and surveys and feedback, as well as quantitative evidence in their report. So with that, I turn this tonight's conversation over to um, our principals and our assistant principals for what will be a wonderful conversation. Uh, each of the board members has the full action plans for tonight for efficiency of words. We're going to highlight some of the bigger um, pieces of it, but they are fully prepared to address anything and everything in the action plans that the board has. Okay, I'm going to hand it over. Who's taking the lead on data literacy? Thank you, Emily. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. So I'm going to read to you a quote to anchor the discussion that we're going to have around data literacy. Data in the hands of a few data experts can be powerful, but data at the fingertips of many is what will be truly transformational. Our goal with data literacy is to empower our teachers to become data experts, to be able to review their data, analyze their data, and more importantly, know how to use their data to make important decisions about their instructional practices. That is really the goal of data literacy. So my colleagues and I are going to share what that might look like in each of our individual buildings. And my friend Lucy is going to click, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Perk School. We're excited, Ellie and I are so excited to share with you that we had our very first professional learning community with our kindergarten teachers a couple of weeks ago. We call them PLCs. And a PLC is an opportunity for grade level teachers to come together to do the work that teachers do. They collaborate, they look at data, they make decisions. The most important part of this 
is that there is natural collaboration. Teachers get to share their practices with one another. Teachers get to talk about the same things in the now. And then teachers together make decisions. At Park School, our data literacy looks like this. Our teachers, along with our math teacher leaders and our instructional coach, went into a most recent math assessment. Our teachers, with the support of the math teacher leaders and our coach, were able to not analyze the entire assessment, but really pay attention to the standards that are aligned to the first unit in the mathematics uh, work that the students are doing. So it would have been overwhelming to look at every item analysis, but what we did was look at the few questions that were aligned to the standards. And together, they decided what would be appropriate for small group instruction. And that was the work that we did during our PLCs. So some of the evidence that we're going to be looking at to measure our growth and success with this work is, of course, our schedules. And by the way, they've been pre-scheduled, so teachers already have a list of dates when we'll be meeting. And we will be doing them for both pre-K and kindergarten at Park School. Our agendas is very focused and intentional. The agendas all have to do with looking at data. It's a similar process, reflecting on data and responding to the data. And the way that we respond to data is by looking at students' strengths and then meeting them where they are. So we're not looking for deficits, we're looking for what students can bring in their classrooms because we know that that is most engaging and motivational for students. And like I said before, the, work, the best work is watching teachers share and collaborate their work with one another. So that's an example of how we're doing it at Park School. Lucia. Thank you, good evening. I'd like to invite our assistant principal, Dr. Velez, to speak about data, data literacy at Brookside. Good evening. Last year, Brookside teachers learned how to use school pace and ARC to assess readers. This year, we've begun to build the, on the data literacy of our teachers by triangulating our school pace data with our NWEA math and reading growth data. NWEA growth data gives us another window into students' progress compared with their national peers. We not only can identify and target instruction for struggling students with this information, but also identify some higher achieving students who are not making progress as quickly as their peers on the national level or have greater evidence of the notorious summer slide as we begin our school year. Our Monday professional development time this past month was focused on unpacking the data that was collected through our administration of the fall MAP assessment. We guided teachers through a deep dive into three instructional reports that are provided post-test, the class report, student profile, and instructional grouping report. After explaining each report and the information that they can provide, we gave time for teachers to sit with each other, dig through data, ask questions, and share noticings. Teachers responded positively to this experience, and we look forward to having more learning opportunities for teachers to build data literacy. We will continue to revisit MAP data over the year, not only to guide classroom instruction during our newly formed math professional learning communities, but also identify trends and patterns across classrooms so that school leaders can monitor and refine goals. Good evening, board trustees, administrators, teachers, community members. I'm really happy to talk to you a little bit about data literacy um, in terms of school pace. Data can feel like a table of numbers, but data also tells us an important story. At Claremont, as in each of our elementary buildings, now that we have a year under our belt of using various data dashboards, we begin to use these platforms with a deeper understanding in order to learn these academic stories of our children. So platforms such as Infinite Campus, which holds our attendance and MTSS and behavior data, school pace data, which holds our ERLA and our ENEAL, the NWEA that Dr. Velez just talked about, which is used for multi-tiered 
systems of support, and then Branching Minds, which is a platform that kind of holds all of it together for us. And all of this gives us valued information to support tier one, two, and three instruction. Tonight, I'd like to focus our data literacy conversation through the School Pace platform. During our very first ARC professional learning session with our ARC coaches, our teachers used the School Pace platform, which we had explored last year, to view the reading history of each child in their class. This history showed us the progression of each child from fall to spring from the previous year, as well as conferring history. That means one-on-one -on -one group meetings between teachers and students, power goals, and teacher notes about students. So this information guided us in our practice of assessing students at the start of the school year using two different infrastructures, the phonics and the vocabulary infrastructure, as well as something called the cold read, which is where we ask students to choose a story they want to read to us within a particular level. Once a teacher determines the level, teachers will use this data to assign what we call a power goal for each student. The purpose of this goal is for teachers to explicitly instruct this goal and for students to focus on what to do as they move to independent reading. So for example, if a student is working on compound words or chunking unknown words, what would they do when they come across an unknown word when they're independently reading? So the small group instruction helps give students these strategies they could use. It should be noted, though, that student voice is also part of our data. And at this point of the year, students across our elementary schools have surveyed students in reading and writing engagement by asking them questions like, do you like to read? What are you reading right now? Do you like to write? What do you like to write about? And that data will also be used to guide our instruction. I now would like to invite Katie Minaya to speak on Roosevelt's data literacy. Thank you, Principal Shamsi, and to all of my colleagues. And it's really such an honor to be here tonight and build upon all the amazing work that is happening at each of our schools and helps build the foundation so that by the time we get to fifth grade at Roosevelt, the students, too, are really a part of the data literacy. You can ask any student what they're working on, what their goals are for themselves, and they can tell you. And it's really important that we also empower our families as partners to be a part of our data literacy as well. So every single committee, every single teacher team really attends to the unique strengths of the individual student. And that includes all students. Every student is unique, every student is different, and sometimes students are even different across content areas. So we wanna make sure that we're really expanding the learning opportunities for all of our students, meeting them where they're at, and making sure every child feels appropriately challenged. And um, we also make sure that every committee is supportive of teacher, staff, student, and family voice, including our equity committee, social emotional learning committee, our culture of care committees. One of the things that we do is, as you would see in our evidence, is each of our teams collects data throughout. We use Google Forms all the time to collect data from everyone, and that includes students, includes staff and families, and that informs the work that we do uh, in terms of everything, programming, um, we really try to make sure that that drives all of our action as a school. It's not just about myself and Ms. Pueyo, our amazing assistant principal. It's not just our vision. It's really a shared collective use of data to drive instruction, programming, even assemblies, everything that we do. And so we look closely daily at all of our data, math data, literacy data, attendance data, our social emotional learning screener, to really cultivate that sense of belonging. Um, and we use that data to, to, to really set the vision of our school and build upon what's happening at each of the other schools. And we're very proud of that collaboration with the other elementary schools. Um, and so if you look into a classroom at Roosevelt, you will really be able to ask the students, you know, what are you learning right now? How are you growing as a leader? 
um, and the students and the staff really have that shared communication and both teaching staff and the students can really talk to their strengths, their passion, and what they need to do next so that they can continue to grow. Thank you. One of the most coveted times in a classroom is when teachers are able to engage in small group instruction. There's something to be said for, yes, the small teacher to student ratio uh, that is manageable, but also it provides teachers an opportunity to bring together a group of five to six children and work on a common need that they have. And in Austin this year, one of our instructional focus areas will be small group instruction. Emily will now speak to what that looks like at Park. Thank you. So our work at Park School is child center in every aspect of the word. We approach this methodology for teaching our youngest students because we know is where they're going to get the most targeted instruction from their teachers. At Park School, we've been very fortunate not only to already be practicing small group instruction, but to really guide our practice by watching students. Our observational tools that are both organic in the classroom, but also our formative assessments guide us in what that small group instruction is going to look like. This year in pre-K, we've adopted a new program called Benchmark Ready to Advance. The foundation of that program is based on the fact that students are going to be working in individual centers with peers, but also guided by their teachers in very intentional ways. And small group, is not just about reading in small groups or math in small groups. We are talking about small groups in all subject areas. The picture behind me is an example of what it might look like in a kindergarten class. The teacher is leading a small group during writing time. It's a very intentional way that we, we sit our students in. Our furniture is flexible in that we can move students around when we need to. This teacher is paying attention to what students are doing, and she is adjusting and targeting by asking specific guiding questions to eventually help students work independently. The power of small group, as Lucia mentioned, is not just about the ratio, but it's also about tapping into what students can do because they also serve as models for one another. And that is the power of the work that we do in small groups. It is also where our teachers get to differentiate. No matter where students are, the power of a small group is really that we can target that in specific lesson to that student. And so at Park School, we are going to measure evidence of successful small groups by looking at our equitable conference schedule, which my colleague Frazine has already spoken about during our toolkit lessons, um, looking at the power goals in kindergarten, and also looking at our Erla and Anil data. And what's not here is also our benchmark data from pre-K. Lucia, how do you do small groups? Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Almost exactly a year ago, the New York Times published an article on the substantial decline of mathematics scores across our nation. Nationwide results showed a substantial decrease, a, the steepest de decline in 30 years. It goes without saying that our approach to teaching and learning and mathematics needs as much attention now and strategizing as literacy often gets. So across our four schools this year, we have identified a time within the school day for children to receive additional small group instruction in mathematics within their class setting. This time offers teachers an opportunity to target specific skills with students based on their data, like chapter assessments, benchmark assessments, exit tickets. This small group of instruction is in addition to the mathematics lesson for the day and any small group instruction that might already take place for that math lesson and within that lesson. During this additional time of targeted instruction, teachers get to reteach content that students may show difficulty grasping or that they simply need more time of exposure to. One of the conundrums that educators often face is how do you keep up with pacing and cover the lengthy scope and sequence while still slowing down to support the struggling learner? 
This additional small group instruction time gives teachers an opportunity to address skills that remain a deficit for students while moving forward with the pacing. It also allows teachers to meet with students who are excelling in the content and to provide them with an enrichment opportunity, exposing the children to more challenging content, again, based on the data. While a group meets with the teacher, the other students are engaged in, center, in centers that are data-based, either in partnerships or independent activities, and that provides children with additional practice and specific skills and content. We are confident that this will help to show growth across our NWA MAP data, as well as our benchmark assessments, not only for our struggling learners, but also for those students who are on or above grade level. As we all know, small group instruction offers a space for differentiation of learning with explicit instruction. So my task this evening is to speak to you about what reading and writing might look like across our buildings. Teachers teach core instruction, which means this is the whole class main lesson in both reading and writing. During independent work time after the main lesson is taught, teachers will then meet with small groups to support students with targeted skill practice. During writing groups, teachers and students will be seen using graphic organizers, checklists, and rubrics to support students with their writing skills. Within reading, as I had mentioned earlier, once teachers determine a student's reading level along with that power goal, teachers create an equitable conference schedule. And what that means is what small group instruction looks like in order to target student needs. Focusing on one goal at a time allows students to participate in the achievement of the chosen goal. Teachers can strategically group students by goals when engaging in small group instruction. They then use what we call toolkits to target specific reading goals. Toolkits are specified explicit lessons. Small flexible grouping allows teachers to group students based on specific needs, such as explicit phonics instruction, if that's what's needed, explicit guided reading circles, or reading comprehension strategies. Scaffolded instruction allows for the gradual release of responsibility to students as they develop to become more proficient, proficient readers. Our professional learning, also known as PLCs, that Emily described earlier, with our teachers will continue to develop high leverage strategies to support our reading and writing small group instruction this year. As my colleagues have mentioned, when a student is working in a small group, they feel that sense of belonging and support. They know that their teacher is giving them exactly what they need when they need it. And it's a powerful tool that really drives academic outcomes and social outcomes for our students. So when we talk about small group instruction, we see it across every content area, including our social emotional learning curriculum this year, which is called Second Step. It can be an empowering opportunity for students to really dive deeply, especially in a departmental model where we have the luxury of having our ELA teachers with social studies and then our math teachers teaching science. And so we constantly are looking at both formative and summative assessments from the curriculum and just from kid watching. Just because it's fifth grade doesn't mean we stop really looking at kids, watching kids. Even today, a teacher just took out a giant spreadsheet of all the anecdotal records she's been taking just from kid watching. And we use that to strategically group our students together. And those groups are not fixed. They may change from day to day. They may change every couple of weeks depending on the needs of the students and the growth of our students. We also want to make sure that everyone here on the board and in the audience understands that small group instruction is not just for students that might be struggling in a certain area. It's also an incredible opportunity to develop student voice, student choice, and leadership. In fact, I was so moved recently when I um, walked into two math classrooms and I saw that students were even leading small groups themselves and applying what they learned and becoming leaders themselves. It was a very powerful thing for me to witness. 
I also noticed that um, across the board, all of our schools have MTSS teams that meet regularly and analyze all of our data, and that's inclusive of academic data, but also attendance data, behavioral data, so that we can really truly understand our, um, our needs as a school, and then work together with our interventionists and our ENL teachers as well to collaborate and talk about our, um, our next steps and figure out how do we prioritize the needs of the students in our school as a team. It's extremely collective. These are conversations that are happening across our teams and with all of our interventionists um, and, and, and truly uh, enables us to support tier two and tier three support and collaboration. So you're seeing small group instruction across the board like you see in the photo behind me you see our math interventionist working with a small group of students, but that does not mean that that is in isolation. What's happening is she is supporting the needs of the students, the strengths of the students, and empowering them so that when they're back in their classroom in tier one instruction, that they are applying what they've learned, their increased confidence, and their ability to apply the skills that they're learning in this small group setting. So some of the evidence that we're going to be collecting all throughout the year is engagement scores. We're looking at their reading and writing engagement because it's not just that kids are at a reading level, it's also how engaged are they as readers and as writers. We're looking at their IRLA and ENIL scores, which is both English and Spanish literacy. We're looking at their NWA MAP growth across the years as well. And then creating those equitable conference and small group schedules, which again, like I said, will be changing all throughout the year as our students are growing and learning and applying what they've learned. Thank you. Okay, so next I am going to um, introduce a quote from um, a mentor and a thought leader in the field of equity and teaching who I'm so grateful that we've been able to partner with. Um, Dr. Goldie Muhammad actually presented uh, virtually to all of our staff this year, and she reminds us of the genius of all of our students, and it's our job to cultivate their genius and make sure that we create the conditions to see the student's genius that sometimes is below the surface, and we have to make sure they know it just as well as the staff know it and their families know that all of our students are geniuses. It is our job as educators to not just teach skills, but also to teach students to know, validate, and celebrate who they are. And now we'll talk about equity across our elementary schools. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Um, I am excited to share the commitment of equity, a sense of belonging, and a love for learning at Park School. It is not just a statement, but a lived reality. Um, it is something that we continually strive for in all aspects of our curriculum and our culture. Park School recognizes that for many of our students, this is the first time they go to like, formal schooling. And we wanna, we have the unique opportunity to give them the positive experience for, for them to love school and love learning. We started the year in Superintendent's Conference Day by having us teachers reflect of how do they want to feel when they come to school? What is the sense of belonging to them? How do they want our students to feel when they come in? And we, and we used that information and they were able to write to continue our work and use it as feedback on other things that we need to do. Our core objective is to ensure that every student feels a sense of belonging. This means students are not just accepted, embraced, that are valued and supported. We place a strong emphasis on developing positive relationships with students, and with their peers, and also with their teachers, creating an atmosphere that everyone feels valued. Our commitment to diversity is not just confined in words. It's also deeply ingrained in our curriculum. For example, last week and this week, our students are participating in a hands-on STEM challenge, and in that challenge, they are engineering the letters of their names using a variety of raw materials, and they're in, we integrating reading, engineering, art, math, making learning experiences meaningful and engaging for our students. We also organize assemblies and events from different cultures. For instance, on September 27th, we have Folklore Urbano, which is um, to celebrate um, Hispanic Heritage Month, 
It was an interactive theatrical um, show with music, dancing, acting, exploring the rich culture and, um, and geography of, of Latin America. The evidence that we are using for um, inequity to ensure the well-being of our student is the DESA questionnaire, which is an assessment aligned with the CASEL framework, the five competencies of the social-emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Additionally, we also have teachers' ref um, reflections, feedback, and survey surveys to continually provide relevant and meaningful experiences for our students. Emily will now also share a new project that we have this year called Story Walks. Thanks, Sally. So the Story Walk project actually started by um, a committee of teachers who were actually part of our equity committee. And they felt that um, the work that we were doing in equity was really housed and based in the work that we were doing as teachers. And we felt that we needed to visibly and physically embrace and have children see what we mean when we talk about equity. So through the Austin Matters grant and with our fabulous PTA, we've been able to um, initiate a project called Story Walks. And basically what it is, um, is a live representation, visual representation on story panels created by um, our teachers. And the team is actually selecting very specific book titles, so literature that kids, everybody in the entire building will be engaged in reading. And the idea is that as a school community, we are embedding messages of empathy, kindness, what the world needs now, right, Mary? Um, and this will be a visible representation of what we, what we mean when we say equity at Park School. Right, so for our three and four and five year olds, it's not enough to just say we're an equitable school. We have to really show our students what we mean by that. And so our teachers will have the opportunities to bring their classes to the story walk halls and talk about the messages in the books that we're selecting for our entire park school family to be part of, so. Thank you. As Ellie said, a sense of belonging has to be a lived reality. As important as it is for our students to have a strong sense of belonging, it is just as important for our faculty to have a sense of belonging that is strong. We can only foster that sense of belonging in our students if we ourselves feel that we belong. To support this work at Brookside, we have two professional learning study groups focused on equity and social emotional learning respectively. The equity group has chosen to engage in a book study this year of Lisa Delpit's book, Other People's Children, Cultural Conflicts in the Classroom, which they will center critical conversations on. The SEL group will continue to implement the Second Steps curriculum for adults, using two specific modules that focus on equity and belonging and resiliency and efficacy. The work in both groups is facilitated by teacher leaders and our wonderful social workers. Although staff have the option of joining these groups, all faculty are connected to the work with the help of our school-based leaders who then design and facilitate related activities during our faculty meetings throughout the school year. Ferzi. Thank you. So part of teaching students to know, validate, and celebrate who they are is to allow them to have a voice and choice. The leadership journey begins in different ways for different students. Park School has kinder leaders that make decisions with building administrators based on surveys and conversations in collaboration with Roosevelt leaders who visit Park School to model what leadership looks like. Brookside School has a student council that represents school voice and meets with school leaders to inform school-wide decisions, such as voting on a new school mascot, which is the Brookside Bee. At Roosevelt, students express leadership by writing proposals for their own after-school clubs and participating in restorative practices such as peer resolution. At Claremont School, students have the choice to apply to be spirit leaders, garden leaders, equity leaders for change, my Brother's Keeper, and Girls Inc. leaders. 
Leadership offers the ability to develop critical thinking, decision making, and problem solving. A lot of what's on our portrait of a learner. Much of student leadership is not only the impact on yourself, but the impact you have on others and how you can contribute to a community. Spirit leaders drive the culture of student joy in the building, whereas our equity agents of change lead a chosen community project. This year, it will be in collaboration with One World and their sustainability project. In the picture that you see behind me, the garden leaders harvested in the colonial garden last week in order to support our local food pantry, thanks to a partnership with ENU Builds. Finally, it's my turn. Good evening, everyone. I am so excited to build upon the work that's been happening at our different elementary schools. As students enter their last year of elementary school and we're preparing them for sixth grade and beyond, we really want them to feel a sense of culture, sense of belonging with a lens through equity the minute they step into the building. We hope that when anyone enters Roosevelt, thanks Sophia, when everyone enters Roosevelt School, they feel that they are welcome there. And to that end, Ms. Minaya has allowed me to talk about what is the most exciting thing for me. So she's also given me student choice. Um, <laughs> clubs. We believe that students who have selected their clubs and with our club leaders, we have created over 20 clubs before and after school at Roosevelt School. These include Spanish club, multi degrees with peaches, um, student equity, uh, gaming, sports, um, a snail club. Um, I could just go on and on about the different types of clubs that are offered, but the most important thing about these clubs is that they offer a sense of leadership and problem solving and opportunity for kids to advocate for themselves and also for others. We are very big at Claremont School. You have to be an upstander. So we're continuously talking about how do you advocate for yourselves, how you advocate for others. So for example, if you're in the Mud Degrees program with Peaches, which everybody knows and loves, they're also working around ending animal homelessness. If you're in Nature Girls, on Tuesdays, our girls take a trip to T-Town. They're also learning not only how to become better leaders themselves, but they're also learning how to preserve nature. So we're very excited that these clubs are offering those opportunities to our students. Consequently, when they come to our school, we are requiring them to actually implement these skills that they've learned in their clubs in their everyday lives in their classrooms. So through problem solving, mediation, which is we do a lot of that, especially because soccer is a very big thing in our building. So we mediate, we help them to mediate amongst, amongst themselves. So these restorative um, circles are being brought to life by the students themselves because of the clubs that they're learning in the clubs or the strategies that they're learning in the clubs. So we're very excited about that. In addition to that, we also visit the different elementary schools, like for example, Park School, Claremont School, where our student leaders will be teaching them leadership skills and also instilling a love of learning and literacy in the younger grades. Based on um, Goldie Mohammed's work, we're constantly thinking about joy. What brings students joy? Is it having a conversation with a teacher? Is it have being principal for a day with Ms. Minaya? Is it getting a snack from a teacher? So we try to make sure that students have choice around those issues as well. And then every single day, we have community circles that teachers are leading. In addition to those community circles, which they're talking again about, how do you feel in the school? What is your sense of belonging? What can we do to support you as you're growing and learning as a leader? We also talk about issues that are happening not only in our school, but in our world as well. And these are problem solved with the students. What can you do to make a difference in our school? What can you do in your community? And what can you do in the world? These community circles then empower Ruse News. And Ruse News, we're trying to figure out how often we're going to do it during the school week. But this is where we share information about what's happening all around the world most importantly at Roosevelt School, where we talk about celebrating different students, different teachers, we're talking about issues that we want to solve, we're doing a big um, anti-bullying curriculum right now during Ruth's News. We want to make sure that students understand that everything they're talking about before school, during school and after school, impacts them in a way that they can make a difference and change. 
in order for them and for us to know how they're feeling and if they have a sense of belonging, we are going to be continuing to use the DESA uh, data collection system, and we're also going to be using Panorama Data Service Survey throughout the year, which would allow us to make shifts and changes as needed as we implement equity and clubs. Thank you. So I am so fortunate to share the cover slide of our last section. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, but I won't be talking about it. I'm just introducing. So as we say that relationships with our children are crucial to their success and our success in school, equally are the relationships that we nurture and we cultivate with families and with the community. Because we have heard this before, it takes a village. This quote is from Karen Mapp. My advice is that we see our families and community members as co-creators and co-producers of the excellent schools and learning opportunities that we want for all of our students. Ellie alluded to the idea that at Park School we are, we are nurturing our students for the first time as students, right? The same goes with our parents and families. So the work of our family engagement specialist, Ms. Inga, is pivotal. It's so crucial because she is the liaison between Park, everything Park and our families alongside of Ellie and I and our, and our teachers. But it's really the important work that we have to start at Park School so that the Austinning experience is not just an experience that our students have, but that our families share and partake in as well. So we take that, we make that commitment and um, we work tirelessly to make sure that parents get what they need, get their answers, get their questions answered, and feel a sense of belonging in their schools as well, not just for our students. So that is the biggest, the biggest uh, pillar that we are lifting when we talk about family and community at Park School. In addition to that, we work tirelessly with some of our community businesses and community organizations. And one of the things that I'm, we're most proud of is the collaboration that we have with Iona College. Iona College um, offers us an opportunity to work with their students, their, specifically their occupational therapist students who are learning what it means to become therapists within this field. So they bring their expertise to, their, to our classrooms. And last year we were able to actually create centers in our pre-K classrooms where teachers had materials and the students came into their classrooms and really supported their work um, around occupational therapy. Everyone knows that Park School, we love to celebrate and have a lot of fun. Make sure to come to the Halloween parade on the 31st. It is another way that we collaborate and support and invite families and parents to really be part of our, our school experience. And one of the things that we started when Ellie and I first took over Park School was this idea of transition, students coming in as pre kers And so we um, initiated this program called um, Countdown to Pre-K, which actually looked a lot different many years ago. But this program that we've had now successfully for two years is really about using our, again, thinking about data literacy, looking at our data during our pre-K screenings and determining which students really need support in that transition to school experience. And so we're very happy with um, the program and we expect to continue to grow this program. It's really not just about the students' transition, but like I said before, it's about onboarding families as well. And so our parents are able to participate in this one hour session twice a week during the summer months before students come into school. So our evidence that we're going to be looking for is again the presentations that we share with families, attendance during these meetings, and all of the agendas with our family engagement specialists. We're incredibly lucky in Austin to take a community schools approach that offers students wraparound services. Studies on community schools show that these types of schools have a lower chronic absenteeism rate, they have lower discipline incidents, a lower, lower number of dis disciplinary incidents and in, compar in, in comparison to other schools that aren't community schools, and they also have higher graduation rates. 
At Brookside, like in all of our schools in Austin, we leverage the partnership that we have with Open Door. And we really rely on this partnership to provide immunizations to our children, physical health exams, and even dental services. Offering this service in the school building really permits us to ensure that there's less instructional loss for students who may otherwise be pulled out of the school day uh, to attend a medical appointment. We're also fortunate to partner with Andrus, a mental health service provider offering more intense counseling and therapeutic services to students who could really benefit from it. And providing this service directly in our school building ensures that one, the students are actually getting the therapy and they're getting it consistently. And it also ensures that there's more effective communication between the school staff and the provider on the child's needs and strategies that work best. We're proud to offer another year of the United Way after school services as well for our Brookside students. Students who participate benefit from homework help as well as academic targeted instruction, which is coordinated by the educational liaison who's a Brookside teacher herself. Additionally, students engage in enrichment activities such as STEM, physical education, dance, and it provides our kids with experiences and opportunities to really decide on what it is, what skills and hobbies and activities that they're really into at the age of five, six, and seven. Jeanette? Good evening, board trustees, administrators, and community. I am so happy to be able to share with you about a few of our, our community partnerships. As we know, community partnerships can offer numerous benefits for our schools and families as they foster collaboration between institutions and the communities that they serve. Over the years, our schools have formed many community partnerships. As Emily mentioned, Iona supports Park School. It also supports Claremont with virtual tutoring program for both ELA and mathematics. Pace University offered us student tutoring programs in the past such as bookworms. This year, the HELPS program is what they're offering and it uses specific fluency protocols to, to target and support our tier two students. Manhattanville College supports our adult professional learning and in addition, gives our fourth graders a day-long experience on their campus. The Family Resource Center of Yonkers offers in-person, one-to-one academic support through the LEAP program after school to some of our students. Bethany Arts collaborates with our students and our families in showcasing art in their gallery for both Roosevelt and for Claremont students. One World is a long -term, as a longtime partner for Claremont School in offering us a way to connect with schools in other countries. Volunteer classrooms have connected with students in schools in Ecuador, Mexico, and in China. Last year, One World worked with our student, ex student leaders to, cre to create the Agents of Change program that drove our topic of inclusiveness. This year, our equity student leaders will use the Agents of Change protocol to support the sustainability focus, which is our district focus. ENU, Empower Network Uplifts, Builds has supported our Colonial School Garden, and this year is engaging our garden student leaders in planting, cultivating, and harvesting crops that are donated to the community food pantry, as you saw in an earlier image. Finally, we want to thank our amazing PTA for everything they do to enrich our students. Our next event is on October 27th, which is our trunk or treat. Please join us, it's gonna be lots of fun. Our hope is that our continued community partnerships leads to improved educational outcomes for our children along with support for our families. Thank you. So as we continue on this journey through elementary school and we arrive at um, Roosevelt, one of the things that we're trying to do is to make sure that our parents are also partners in all programming. And so we talk with our PTA and with family volunteers and we work to elicit their ideas to help inform even our assemblies, all the activities we do, we're in, in the works for creating a fall festival similar to what Claremont does is their enrichment day and we're going to have an outdoor um, festival in November and the students are voting on their ideas for the activities and then we're inviting community partners to be a part of it like Mike Risco Music School, um, Hudson Valley Books for Humanity and so we're really excited that continuing that theme of staff voice, 
student voice, family voice. Uh, we also are planning uh, many different events and we want to continue what Dr. Nover started last year with the Roosevelt team, which was a culminating fifth grade experience, a parade and really a, a celebration of the fifth grade journey. And so we're planning that as well. We also work hard to make sure that the weekly Oblast is a place where we can highlight community partnerships and, um, and work in collaboration to ensure that families have opportunities both inside school and outside of school to enrich not just the student, but the entire family. We also give social emotional learning tips for our families that we use from our second step curriculum and as much as possible try to really communicate different opportunities and always bilingual and that's across all of our schools that we make sure that everything that we put out is um, language accessible for all of our families. We're also very, very proud to partner with Boys and Girls Club um, the every day until 6 p.m. And that's a tremendous opportunity. Our students absolutely love it and it really supports our families. Um, we work with Girls Inc., T-Town, Austin Inc. Historical Society, Bethany Arts, One World, Rockefeller, BOCES Team Building, just to really enrich our emphasis on multiple literacies for our students and ensure that that joy is always there for our families and students and staff alike. One thing we also do that Claremont I know also has done is a Google form at the beginning of the year and we actually ask the families do you have an expertise that you would like to teach to other families? And that's been really, really helpful in making sure that our families know that they are their first child's teacher and they have so many strengths and expertise that can be benefit other families in the school as well. And we're also starting to work toward um, restorative practices for families as well. That might take the appearance of, which we've done already, student, family, and teachers together having a restorative circle and that's been very effective in helping us really set a strong foundation for the year, and we hope to expand that. And so the evidence we'll be collecting is through club rosters, our attendance data at each of the clubs. Uh, we're looking at those Google forms that we'll be sending throughout, um, and, and also our assembly and event schedule, and then auditing that every year together with families, together with students, together with staff, to make sure that we're being responsive, knowing that every year is different and the students and families in front of us are different each year. So how can we make sure that they have a voice and a part, true partnership and true empowerment as the Karen Map quote um, guides us from the beginning of this section? Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking at Angela. Thank you. Um, so much work clearly went into this presentation. Before I um, share my questions and comments, I'd like to open up to the rest of the board. Anybody? Trustee Gomez? Um, thank you so much for that. And just personally with the United Way program, my son has been going twice a week and he loves it. He asks me if he, every day if he has after school. <laughs> Um, I have a few questions. For these small groups where children are, it's a two-part question. For the small groups, are they based on ability level of the child? When we talk about um, ability level, so in literacy, for example, Frazine spoke about uh, using the school pace data where we would have students grouped based on it could be their level that they're reading at but also it could be a strategy that it, it might be that the student across various levels students across various le levels are a need need a strategy to be emphasized or reinforced so it's both based on ability uh, but also it could be based on content as well uh, similarly in math it could be based on something that you want to preview with the group of students because they're ready for it. Um, sometimes it's also based on interests. If you know that a child, if a group of children are, especially in, in the upper grade schools, if uh, children are demonstrating interest in a particular genre, then there might be a book club based on um, a particular genre or a book study across a, a group of students. So it really varies but you're on the right track in asking whether it is a bit ability level. It generally tends to be ability level. Um, and then again, it could also cover um, content as well. 
I love that individualized instruction. Annie, I also, um, it's important to note that it's intentional. So a teacher will always know why he or she is choosing to work with those students in that particular group. So it could be based on ability, but sometimes it's not always, because we're always looking and tapping into what students bring to the table, so we're using their strengths, like I said before, like to model for other kids as well. So it's all about the teacher's purpose and their why. I just want to add one more thing. What I've also noticed, I've actually seen this at every one of the schools, is also teachers opening up small group instruction to a student that might advocate for themselves, even at the youngest grades, and say, I might need a lot of extra help. I'm a little bit stuck on this. I need help. And they would self-select into a small group. And I have found that to be really powerful because that's so like metacognitive that a child can say, you know what? I know enough about myself to know that I'm struggling with this particular skill or objective, and I'm going to ask, the, I'm going to stay with the teacher for a little extra help. And there's never any stigma with that. And I love that that's been normalized across all of our schools, that it's actually brave when you can ask for help and stand up for yourself. So I commend all my colleagues because I've seen that, and it's a really powerful practice for small group instruction. Thank you. And then the second part of that question was when children, you said that they sometimes lead small group instruction, is that within their own interest level, ability level, or would they be maybe a student who's really strong in one aspect would be leading a small group instruction for other students who are not quite as strong? It could be both. It could be that a child has already exceeded the specific lesson objective and wants to help peers. But we also use it as a tool to build up the self-esteem of a student that might be struggling. Maybe they got it in this one lesson and you're just finding the good and helping that child feel like a total celebrity. Oh my gosh, you worked so hard. This was really, really a hard concept for you for the last week, but you persevered, you did it. Now would you like to go and lead a small group? And that makes them feel so special because some students you know, struggle sometimes with their self-confidence. I know I did growing up in math, but that kind of a leadership opportunity and just affirmation can be a really powerful tool to transform that negativity bias that a child might have and make them feel really strong and confident. So I see it used in many different ways. Yeah, I want to say most of the small groups that we're talking about here in terms of are, are really teacher-led groups. So it's really where we're using that data literacy that we spoke to in the earlier slides to ensure that we are giving targeted, explicit instruction to the small group that's sitting in front of us. And when we release the students to go back to independence, they're leaving with a skill and a task to practice and practice and practice until we bring them back to us again and we assess to see, did you meet this? If they didn't, we, we instru explicitly instruct again differently, but if they met it, we move on to the next goal. I think that the times in an elementary setting where you will see student-run small groups might be some of these leadership roles that we've given students. It might be like a second step curriculum where we're learning about social-emotional well-being, and if I'm talking about self-management, that might be in a small group with my peers. Daily we do things like turn and talks or working together in math, math small groups or math pairs during lessons. That's where children partner together. So there are those type of groups as well. Thank you. Um, for equity and these very amazing sounding clubs, I forget what one of the clubs was. Snail it's club? Nice. Snail. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, snail Snail. 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 <laughs> I was wondering how they're funded, if they require funding, do students have to pay or is it open and accessible to any student? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. We are very grateful for um, all these clubs are free for our students. Um, students self-select the clubs with their families. They get a Google form at the beginning of the year with all the options. We also provide them transportation um, if they are able to re receive a bus during the school day, they can get a bus home, which is fantastic. They get a snack. 
So they all gather in the cafeteria, they get a snack, and then they go to their different clubs. So it's totally free thanks to our school district and our community and all of you here who have approved that for us. One of the things that I must say about our clubs also is that one of the things that we want to share with you is that because we want to make sure that our most vulnerable kids are also in this club, we make an effort to look at the list from our support team and we make um, our family engagement specialist actually calls all of these students and their families and informs them of what the clubs are, if they're available, and if they can um, you know, send their child to that club. So it's an amazing opportunity for all of them. Um, our partnerships um, are all free of service for them and uh, we're very excited to partner with them. They're fantastic. Each club has about 25 students. Uh, we had to op uh, open a second uh, multi-degree um, multi um, club because Peaches is very popular, so we have two days of that. <laughs> Do you know who Peaches is? Yeah, he came, Peaches came last year. Oh, okay, good, perfect. Yeah, like, yes, yes, here. excellent. Here. Yeah. She's very famous. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, Peaches. <laughs> And I think also, Dr. Dooley, happy birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday, Dr. Dooley. Happy birthday. I don't know who Peaches is, but they sound We'll bring her to you. Don't <laughs> worry. We'll bring her. She's a dog. <laughs> Ask Aiden. He knows. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I loved That was a great response. I was really happy to hear it. Um, my last question is for dual language families, I hear a lot of times that families need tutoring. And with our community partnerships, are there any tutoring opportunities for families who may not be able to afford private tutoring? You know, it's something that's definitely come up in the past before. It, it, during the pandemic, we were able to provide um, seat, like high school students to support Spanish language skills of our elementary school, uh, students at that time. Since then, it's certainly a topic of, of discussion. We have talked about it during our budget cycles, and we'll continue to ensure that we give some attention to it. Although we do not have one-to-one -one tutoring, we do offer a Spanish club. And in January, we will start a newcomers club as well. So for those students that are learning English and for those students that are learning Spanish, we will have those opportunities for those students. Thank you. Trustee, are you, are you finished? Yes. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Trustee Malstein, you had some questions? Uh, just two on the data. So as I was taking notes, the data sets we have are NWEA, right, which is reading and math. We have the ERLA, a lot, a lot of acronyms, ERLA. <laughs> that's the ARC reading test. English. Is that? English. A, uh, English. Okay, so that's two. Then we have the DESA, which is SEL. We have Panorama, which is SEL. We have attendance data. And then we have PBIS, which is the behavior data. And then we just got um, a superintendent, uh, might be able to confirm this, I think the state lifted the embargo this week on last year's reading and math score. So sidebar be good or how we're doing there maybe in an upcoming meeting to talk oh, about. It's going to be part of that data discussion that Great. I plugged earlier. Yeah. Excellent. So that's a lot. Like, and I think there was more in there. And then you got the end of it. So the first question is this. As the administrators of the building uh, and getting a sense of the administration and keeping track of all that and having the teachers obviously be intimately involved in it, I just want to confirm, like, there's enough bandwidth to do that, right? Because I work in Adobe Analytics in my personal job. That's one data set. That's a full-time gig all day long, and that's not even my full time. I do the offside of that, so I just want to be, like, uh, just sort of level set. Is there enough bandwidth to collect all of that? And then the second part of this, who's going to be crunching all of this together into a big old dashboard, a tableau, whatever's going to branching minds and sort of making those connections. Because again, that's, I know we have at least one data person that's hired or will be hired. And I know, I think it's Mike Hanna's team, but just want to, like, that's a lot. So this is great. I love the data. I just want to make sure we've got enough staff resources, support, and you feel that way. And then the crunching of it to, to sort of read it out. Your question is wonderful. As, as leaders, I, I'll be honest and say, 
it's, it's our conundrum that we have to deal with, right? Because it's not just the teachers using the data, but we have access to the platforms and it, I read the data over the weekend, try to interpret so that I know how to give feedback. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do, and I spoke a little bit about it through our PLC, is to chunk it so that we're not looking, as I said, like at the entire assessment, but we're looking at certain questions and looking at which standards are aligned within those questions so that we have a tangible and very um, easy way of managing and doing something with it. Because data is wonderful, but if we're not doing anything with the information, then it's not really useful. Um, so that's one way. I don't know. If I can say. add to what Emily just said, if I will, and then pivot to Jessica or Maria. I'll take the state test. If you want to take a look at the, of course, it doesn't apply at Park, but certainly from grades three on, and, or Brookside, um, it's an important piece of information. And item analysis work and uh, a lot of that breaking down does come from the state. They do do that through the RIC. Um, and you look at that piece of information, Emily said the key piece, you know, you're looking at local data about what are the standards tell you, and you can look at the state test the same way. How are we, how, and you look at it in terms of the curriculum. Wow, look at that, how did, how did our curriculum measure up to how the state and how kids performed on that? And then the following year, the data that travels with the child is how they performed on those individuals. You look at it both ways, which is in the spirit of what Emily just said. Um, Jessica, Maria, do you want to add to that? So, yeah, like um, our colleagues on the, in the front of the room, have shared oh, one of the we use all of that data together and one of the ways we're helping to try to make that lift easier for the building and the work that our, our leaders do in the building and teachers do is through branching minds so when we do the NWA assessment data uh, Mike and his team ingest it into branching minds collaborating with them and it automatically tiers the, the students for teachers in addition to that there's an early warning system space that includes the attendance data and uh, the results for ELA and math because the research shows that if you're failing in ELA and math, that there's a high percentage that you're gonna fail. Also science and social studies, literacy, and then the mathematics that's required for science. We also have a, a cohort platform shows all of the data across the year and, and leverages for our leaders in their week in their six week MTSS review how the students compare in their growth across the year, which is a new report that we're just learning about. So as the teams get together and they can go talk about the students, they can see all of that across the system. In addition to that, the colleague that you're talking about in the technology department currently works on reports in pulling in the early data. As we're building the MTSS system in Branching Minds, he's creating reports that pull in the attendance, the behavior, the early reading data, the NWA data, and the state assessment data. So that looking across a student, you can really get a sense using those multiple measures of where the student is brilliant and where the student might be needing some additional support. In addition to that, we are um, moving forward with all our platforms. I lost my thought around the depth. Oh, I know what it was, sorry. I wasn't, I didn't have notes. Another thing to help leverage this for all the buildings and the leaders is in the weekend update, you may recall that I shared that we're embarking on a data project in alignment with ARC to make a comparison of whether our students and their performance in ERLA aligns with the state performance. And that is a data team that ARC is providing us at no cost. So they'll take that on WA data for us and they'll take that ERLA data and they'll make those comparisons and so it's a way of leveraging it and building into the capacity and taking some of the pieces off of the building. It is, uh, it's new, as you are pretty well aware, to the district. I, I want to give Maria Carlson a shout out. She'd probably be very embarrassed that I'm doing this, but I was super impressed when I dropped by her room 
one day and I asked her to explain to me. And she was, with a great deal of ease and professional knowledge, she was able to bring up students. She was able to show me what student was accelerating and what the work was for that. It took her literally five minutes to do that. So I have to give you a huge shout out. You know, if I had a, I've had a, I've had a young one still, a kiddo, I would love to have that kiddo in your class because your knowledge and understanding of your students by doing that. Would we like branching minds to capture everything that's here? Absolutely. But again, this is the start of it. But this is just a highlight. In order to do this work and to make it as seam seamlessly and as important as an intuitive to the work we need to do, it requires a lift. It requires a lift behind the scenes. It requires your directors. It requires your tech department. It requires your central office, your executive cabinet people to pull together, which these are all considered, as you know, because you all read the research, the best practices throughout the state. There's a significant investment into um, ARC reading, and it comes with these analytics involved in it. And to be able to incorporate it into the work we do is essential for teachers and for kids. And to Mary's, oh, and to, hi. And to Mary's point, I think as we consider that we're building this, Branching Minds collaborates with us, and we are able to add information as we work through our MTSS steering committee and get feedback from the fields and you know the people who are doing the work, boots on the ground. So for example, our house structure in the middle school and high school is a nuance to Austin. So we were able to have our students tagged in Infinite Campus and then it is a filter in Branching Minds so that our house teams can quickly look at the students that live inside their houses. So as we continue to grow, we're exploring how to add social studies and science as a tag so that we could also pull students who are, who are having difficulty in those courses and are also having difficulty in math and science. So while the research focuses in the platform on those two subjects, we want to pull in the other subjects. So it's a uh, work in progress. Yeah, thank you. So just a quick, so that clarifies the collection and where it's going. That just to, just to that back to that first part. But we have a feedback mechanism right, from that the building administration and the teachers who are ministering, like the DESA, right, that's administered by teachers on the ground. And then, yes, to the students, just to clarify that all this can be done, there's enough bandwidth, that there's still enough time for instruction as well. Because, again, I love the data. I'm a data person outside the school board, but I want to make sure there is a feedback loop, especially with the superintendent being here and having a fresh set of eyes that, there's not, um, there's not too much here to, to administer, collect, uh, check on, and of course do the day-to-day -day right. job as well. That, that, that was just the first part of my question. I guess I'll give a balcony perspective on that. You, you're looking at this district made a huge commitment to social emotional learning in the work. So you need separate surveys to measure the work that you've done, which is your DASA and your panorama surveys. Austin was one of the first in the region because I looked at it from afar to do that level of work. So collecting that was super important. You've got, uh, you've got academic data in, in your EARLA, your NEE, and your state test. You also have, which is required under the law, attendance data that every teacher should have. So a lot of these data systems sit, existed before, sat independently, and might have come up when you were doing counseling sessions and guidance at administration. But to having that data now available to many that need it in real time is key here. So it's kind of pulling together systems that you had in place before and joining them together for a more comprehensive approach is really the spirit behind MTSS. I just want to clarify something. So it seems like a lot of data points. Um, so NWEA happens three times a year. So we do pause three times a year to administer that assessment. Earl and Anil is ongoing. So the Earl is the English component. The Anil is only given to students that require to have the Spanish component. And that's an ongoing, pulsing type of assessment. It's different in the past. In the past, we were assessing children at benchmark points of the year for reading and writing. No longer. Now it's, it's continuously ongoing. So that data point is looked at on a daily basis by teachers as they're meeting in small groups. Some of these other data pieces are done um, outside of a school day. So the DESA screener was done at a PLC after school where teachers were able to, to really talk about, 
you know, students and what their needs were along with our social workers. Some of the surveys that we give are not necessarily taking away from class time. So I, I don't want to give you the impression that all this data is impacting a child's, you know, joy in education in a classroom, but we use it <coughs> at different intervals. And then the behavior, the attendance, the MTSS teacher team meets every six, uh, six weeks. Um, again, we're not impacting a student's classroom time, but a group of people will meet, um, and it might be a different group every time with different uh, sub subgroups. For example, an ENL teacher, a special ed teacher, a, you know, reading teacher meets with an administrator and a social worker, and we review this a, a data on a six-week cycle to then make some important decisions about groupings in our building. So it is a lot. It, when, I, when you first asked the bandwidth question, I thought you meant in my brain. Do I have the bandwidth in my brain? Um, or was it really like the bandwidth <laughs> to hold the data? I'm assuming there's bandwidth to hold the data. Up here it might be a little different sometimes, but we're, we're adjusting to getting to know all these different critical pieces we have. Any other trustees? I know um, Catherine, feel free to chime in if you've got something off in internet land. Just, just disembodied voice. Okay. Um, <laughs> anybody else? I had um, one question to, um, related to small group instruction, um, specifically as it relates to ARC. So I know that ARC small group instruction is delivered equitably so that the students who need the most get the most. Um, but I'm curious, and this is for anybody who feels comfortable for answering it, because I'm assuming that the question's going to, the answer would be the same. Um, oh. I think she was trying to. Ask yes, I just got a text from Catherine. <laughs> She's trying to. Let me ask my one question, because I'm in the middle of asking it, and then we'll switch over to Catherine. Um, my question is, what is the range there? How often are our neediest students, our students who are furthest behind in reading, being seen for small group instruction in, say, a week, versus our, our um, students who are reading at a more advanced level? Because even a first grader who's our most advanced first grader, so learning how to read, right? So they still need that small group support, too. So what's the range within ARC um, in practice in your buildings? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so the way that the way that the program shows us the data is that we can see children that are reading on grade level, above grade level, and if they're not reading on grade level yet, we could see the the distance, the gap. Um, so by the time they reach Claremont and Roosevelt, the gap sometimes can be great, and so we have a year to fill a gap that's really wide. So there are some recommendations made um, to let us know that students with a very wide gap, a year gap, a two year gap, will need more touch points with the teacher and more times in a small group. Um, and so the toolkit lessons will provide those uh, frequency of lesson planning. And then children that might be reading on or above grade level have the opportunity to meet in a small group with, with teachers but sometimes that involves um, a part of instruction that takes a while. So a teacher might start them off with learning about context clues through deep, complex vocabulary, and I'm gonna give you a chapter book as a group to read, and so I will start you off, but now I'm gonna release you, and I'm gonna bring you back a few days later after you've read the first five chapters in doing this task. So you can't meet as frequently with a child that's in that type of a group setting, because they need time to read those five chapters before I'm now ready to pull you back and engage in deeper um, instruction about that particular topic. So it really depends on where they fall on that continuum. We echo the same thing. Uh, we are looking at our instructional flow. Just last week we uh, provided to teachers a sample of a school day which allots time for an additional small group instruction in literacy as well because we know that we, we, we recognize that small group instruction is what will help students to move the most. Um, and being mindful of the equitable conference schedule, we wish we had more time in the day to work with all of our groups. So we're looking at how we can fit in an additional small group instruction time and literacy as well. And some of our teachers are accomplishing that. 
um, and that allows them to get to more groups, regardless of the level. I guess I'm asking, as a parent, you know, I'm imagining if my uh, student, my child was reading, you know, two grades below grade level at Claremont, that they might be receiving small group instruction, let's say, daily. But if my student is reading one grade level ahead, are they receiving small group instruction once weekly, once twice weekly? I'm just looking, I'm not looking for anything to like nail to the wall, just a general like, what can a parent expect? Does it vary? I mean, it might, and it may well vary, right? Like, because you said you're sending kids home with chapter books, but like, if, like I said, and even advanced first graders, they're not coming home with warm peace, right? They're coming home And that's with the work of our, our with our ARC coaches. Um, and so like this week, for example, at Roosevelt, we had a full day of professional learning for our teacher teams with our ARC coach, Christina. And the topic really was, let's look at our data and make sure that we're creating equitable conference schedules. So equity is not equal. It's right. making sure that <laughs> everyone is getting what they need. And so that's also, you know, teachers are working so hard. I have to give a huge shout out to all of our teachers across the district for lifting all of this um, data literacy, conferring with students, using the data platform, um, really, really understanding the strengths and the needs of each kid, helping assign those power goals, setting up these equitable conference schedules so that every child is challenged and supported in their literacy level and looking at their needs across fluency, comprehension, um, you know, whatever it may be that they're working on to advance. And so that, that really was the work. It was collective work. It was driven by the data in front of us. Um, and so the, each of our schools teachers were able to leave with a plan for the equitable conference schedule. And again, that's not, um, that's not gonna, it might not be the same. Like a kid right now might be getting, you know, three times across two weeks of small group. And maybe they do so well with that small group instruction that when you ask me in two months from now, they might be getting, you know, once. It really is dependent upon the student's needs. And that's why we keep an equity lens through all of our planning for small group instruction. And I don't want to dismiss math. That's also happening with math. Thank you. Um, Catherine, are you still there? <coughs> Angela's nodding, but she is still there. I want to make sure. She says she's here. She texted me that she's here and that she's not muted. Is Okay. Oh. Catherine, is that you? Oh. No? She's texting me now. Angela says you may need to pop out and pop back in, Catherine. You're out there. Okay, I'll um, ask my next question while we're waiting for her. Um, my, ne my other two questions are more organizational. Is that her? Any luck now? Yes, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, Take yay. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm having flashbacks. I'm really sorry for this inconvenience, everyone. I, I know it's frustrating, so I appreciate your patience. Um, and thank you, Christine, for leading the meeting tonight. It's a good thing I didn't elect to do it remotely because I don't know. It just there's all. It seems to always have a glitch, but here we are. Um, I did. There were two things that I wanted to to address. Um, first, just just in case. It's helpful to anyone else to know that the board is also doing its own data review and reflections on itself. And one of the questions in our own self-assessment was whether or not we had developed a shared vision and mission that reflects student achievement and community priorities and communicates that to the community. And here we are, our long range plan is what we led this meeting with, which I, I really love so much hard work and dedication went into developing that. Um, but it, I think it only goes until 2020. Um, so the time for us to review our extending that is now. Um, time to sort of take a year to be on what that process might look like. Sorry. Oh, 
So i um, delighted to say that, and I skipped that, my faux pas in my last slide. The board could choose to adopt because we're moving with that plan, although it officially ended with 2023, but we used it to structure our goals for our work this year. But I would encourage the board to just have a resolution to adopt it for uh, two more years. And we could okay, have that on great. the next agenda. I mean, I can place it there and the board could have a conversation around it. Right. And I certainly think as you, as the board looks at that, it, these plans typically are five years, but the fifth year would be this re, uh, bringing your community group again to look at all of your goals, take a look at your vision statement, everything, and to get feedback on it and whether or not you want to um, upgrade that. So it's a wonderful opportunity to engage with your community for a more granular conversation on it. Okay, great. Um, appreciate that. And, you know, I, I would certainly be supportive of, of that type of a resolution. Um, and then, you know, my next question is really why we had this evening and why we structured it this way is you know, really essentially the most one of the most important functions of the board other than setting policy is to of course budget for the next school year um so my my question is right because we outlined tonight the the various areas that we're taking a look at and the data that we are in the process of collecting and reviewing um when it comes time to budget for the next school year I am going to be interested in hearing from administration again, you know, in order to meet and improve the data that we are looking at, you know, Board of Education, I'm going to need an extra academic in-service, I'm going to need an extra reading teacher, I'm going to need a budget for before and after school, um, Spanish tutoring. So I would just encourage you to the extent that you can utilize the data that you know now, I would be interested in your recommendations based on, on that, of course, when we um, get into our budget season in more detail later on this. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's about it for me. <laughs> Man, Thank you. It sounded like a cartoon, right? right? Like. It's so and classic. I would add that that was aligned, as they all know. That was our conversation. You're going to use this work you're doing right now to help inform the board when you're in budget season. So that would align. Right. And Catherine kind of, I was just going to ask, you know, what, what kind of, what would further support look like for you? And to be thinking about that. So I'm glad we're clear that that's something that we should be thinking about moving forward. Um, my last question is just organizational. Um, when I look at this table, I see such a wonderful group of leaders, um, and I'm so deeply appreciative of all of this work. This is, I know, just represents such a small piece of what you guys do in and out every day. Um, how often do you all meet as a PLC yourselves and um, in order to build off your strengths? And is it enough, or is it, does it take away too much? How, how do we feel about that as a group of administrators? So we have, uh, we have professional, right, we have formal professional development time. So for example, tomorrow we'll spend our day at PARC uh, looking at ARC, and we have an opportunity to look at our own data, which is exciting, um, after a day of seeing practice in another school building. Uh, so that's a, an example of a formal professional development. Once a month we also meet as an administrative team uh, with our assistant superintendent and superintendent. Um, and we also engage in conversations um, around instruction. Um, and we have uh, articles or literature or book studies that we engage in. And this year we're proud to continue our practice of chat and choose. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a time to actually sit and eat and enjoy a meal together, but to support once a month we get to eat. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but we, we, we literally come together to support one another. Um, and we, we actually have an agenda. Uh, so we prepare topics and we just throw them onto the agenda as they come up, like questions that we don't have answers to. And then when we get together, we tackle them together. Um, it also helps to just build cohesion across our buildings, which is important given the Princeton plan. 
um, and to learn from one another and again support one another. So that's something that we've taken on independently. And I know that Ellie and Mirla will not say this themselves, so I'm going to, and Andrea, yeah, they've been working behind the scenes. Um, they saw a need for the assistant principals to also have an opportunity to come together. And they've created a whole scope and sequence informed by other assistant principals' feedback in a Google form and targeting the needs of, for learning for new and returning assistant principals. It's phenomenal. Um, they advocated for themselves. They submitted a plan. Um, and we're so happy that they're doing that work to create that collegiality and have their own PLC for the assistant principals. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Did you want to speak? Trustee Schnecker. Sure. Um, just a few comments and really one question. Um, turning statements into live realities, as you've talked about a lot tonight, is really demanding, but I think really rewarding work. And I just want to commend you really for an excellent presentation. You really gave us a great insight into all that's being done. Um, and this idea of how we partner in partnerships, not just within the buildings, but with our community partners, with our families, and with our community at large in this whole portrait of a learner and making that the lived reality for our students is just really, really powerful. So hearing all the work that you're doing t during the day amongst each other and, you know, with all of our educators and all of our partners really is just really remarkable. Um, I really appreciate the, um, the amount of basically intentional time you take to basically meet on a regular basis to basically review and adjust as we, as we move along through the school year be it through professional learning or um, really just the observation and understanding and empowering of our children. Like that is just really, really, really powerful. Um, and to adjust to their strengths and their needs and their joys. So your message was clearly delivered. I hope the community really um, had the opportunity to see tonight because it's really just amazing work. Um, the question I have for you, right? And so in being on this journey in the past few years and looking at this is, you know, through this, are there trends that you've seen that either support something anecdotally that you knew, that basically now that you were able to gather surveys from the students or something different that basically <laughs> confirmed that? Or was anything maybe, did something new get revealed to you and, and how did you adjust in that? I mean, I think when I, when I spoke either last year or the year before, for me, um, student voice, I think, has been a really powerful learning tool that I wish I had started understanding years ago. Uh, so when little Owen came to me two years ago and sat down and with a piece of paper of the spirit days I had planned for the school and said, Ms. Shamsi, with all due respect, this is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat down and I said, what do you think I should do about it? <laughs> And that's, that was the, st the start of student leadership um, at Claremont. So, so I think voice is really important. Um, I, I think something else I think that we have grown to understand has high success. First of all, I want to state um, as, as complimentary as you were of, of us up here, and thank you so much for your support. Our teachers come into work every single day so dedicated and ready to, to take on every single thing that we encounter in a day. And their commitment to, to really try so hard to ensure that all of our children's needs are met, right? Um, in equity in every single area of our instruction, we have learned that um, there's some high leverage practices that our data um, shows that are effective. And small group instruction is one of them, right? And I think that's the reason that that became a unified focus for our district in this coming year, something we are ensuring that we are embedding not just in reading and writing, but in mathematics and our MTSS small groups. Um, our data shows that when we use small group instruction to target specific skills, it does impact achievement. And so yes, like there are some areas that we are, are noticing and then that becomes something that we all, all embrace together. I mean, I echo what Frazine just shared, and student voice can happen as early as pre-K, and just finding the ways to really have students share their thinking out loud um, as young as three and four. 
But one of the things that I think I knew already, but um, it became more evident, is the, the collective efficacy that this work requires. So it's not about me, the principal, leading the work. It's about our amazing teachers that we have and their effort to learn not just the platform, the tool that they're using, but also to sit in front of kids and to see where they are in the moment. So there's the technical aspect of learning our new curriculum, and it does require a lot of technology. And the learning curve for, for teachers was steep and for us. Um, but because we were all doing it and we were doing it together, it created this momentum. And so today we had our art coach come into Park School to work with our team. And the first thing he said was, okay, how are you feeling, year two? And they were like, oh, easy. Like, we got this. That wasn't the sentiment in the beginning of last year. So for me, understanding that together we're better than doing it alone has been sort of the mantra. And I have to give kudos and credit to our teachers. They're the ones that are living it day in, day out with our students. And they are asking questions. And they are willing to sit with us and look at data together. And they are, they want to just do it well. And, and we recognize that. So every little thing that they've learned that they bring to the table has become exponentially wonderful to see. And so to celebrate our team and our teachers and their, and their efforts, including our interventionists, who are also now partaking in the learning this year, has been incredible work. Great, thank you. I just appreciate the honest feedback of the successes and the challenges and all of that. And just um, really impressed by the work and keep, keep, keep uh, full, full speed ahead. Thank you. So good evening and thank you for being here with us tonight. And thank you for all of the hard work you're doing and also your collective school communities as well. Um, I really like seeing that you all collaborate so intentionally with each other, um, especially Roosevelt being such a standalone school, being very intentional about making sure you're, uh, you know, abreast of what's going on with the children coming into your grade level and how you can keep that kind of momentum going there. So I really appreciate seeing that. I also, um, something I'm always kind of asked through all these presentations, you really showed explicitly here tonight, which is what is the parent and family piece of this look like and how are families involved and how do they feel engaged and it really seems like it's really ramping up to go the extra mile to actually give families tools to really um, support their learners in really organic ways so I'm glad to see that as well. I like the, um, the student voice always and the, and the perspective that that brings to the work, much needed perspective. We want to make sure that um, you know our learners are actually represented well in the work that we're doing so I appreciate that. I really appreciate the effort of making sure you're reaching out to students who might not always be the one to raise their hand and participate in programs. Um, so that's a really, really good feature as well. And um, <coughs> what else do I have down here? I think that was all. I just, I really, really like how it's unfolding and I really like how families are being brought into the, into the mixture of it all to really um, support their learners as well and also feel like they know what's going on and, and feel like they can actually, you know, support them. Um, one question I would have is what are some ways or that you overcome the challenges of making sure that uh, like when you send out surveys or something like that to families that they're receiving them and that they're engaging with them because sometimes it's like oh another survey or sometimes it's oh I didn't know there was a survey that went out so what are some creative ways if any that you've figured out how to make sure that you're increasing the level of engagement from all uh, as many families as possible in the work. We started this last year, right? Yeah. Everything from Backpack Express to um, our Oblast to then we, we made cone, uh, personal phone calls and then we just started texting every parent everything. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we have multiple, multiple ways of trying to reach families, uh, emails, texts, everything, social media. We even have a question in our surveys. It's like, how do you prefer to be you know, in contact? And we actually heard from the PTA last year that parents really appreciate bite-sized text messages. So that is what we do. Mm. Bite-sized text messages, short and sweet. That's a big one. And I just, um, I have to shout out Mirla. You guys know I love shout outs. But the <laughs> fact that we know surveys are not, don't work for everyone, 
literally with our clerical team, Yvonne and Gloria, printing out Google Forms, sending them home when kids come and, and need help, their parents need help, they, technology is a challenge. We will not let technology be an obstacle for any family. It's working collaboratively with our family engagement specialists. Thank you so much for approving the funding of that at Roosevelt and at our, all of our schools now we have them. That is a huge game changer. The outreach, the communication, the support, the helping families learn how to even access Oblast. It, 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 the portal, yes. The, that's all part of like onboarding for new families. Um, and so that's just been a huge, huge support of having a dedicated staff member. Talk about a values-driven budget, an equity-based budget. We appreciate it. One of the things that we started last year was when parents were in the building is to catch them right then and there. So if we had, say, for example, our Thanksgiving feast, we might just leave a little question there. And parents, before you leave, that's your ticket. Like, <laughs> please leave us your feedback. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we're trying to be creative. One of our main surveys of the year was uh, at back to school night when parents, a lot of parents come. <laughs> they do, they came. Um, on the last slide, the teachers shared, we put a QR code because that's what everybody's doing nowadays, yeah. is using QR codes. So we asked parents to scan this and give us some quick feedback on what do you need this year from us. Thank you for that. And I just thank you overall for just from that example and all the other examples you spoke about, um, just the way you're really implementing equity in a very realistic way, um, in a very innovative way. And from how you engage with teachers, with staff, with students, and also families. So commend you all, commend your teams, and just thank you for all that you're doing. Well, I just want to say thank you again on, on behalf of the board um, to our visionary elementary leaders for your wonderful presentation and for your time tonight and for the work you do every day. So, And we're going to hear a little bit more uh, later on in the year, this fall, about our data in, in specific ways. And then again, at the end of the year, the whole team will be back to present about their successes, challenges, and opportunities for improvement regarding the work we set out to commit tonight is a commitment of the work that we're doing for the year to this community to this board so thank you all um i'm having a great time working with you all they all know that okay. thank, you. thank you so much and you don't have to stay here and sit for the rest of the meeting you can go home All right, um, our next agenda item is 2.3. Um, we're discussing the pro proposed partial tax exemption for firefighters and ambulance workers. Um, Alita has an updated um, slideshow. Do you want to present it, Alita? So I'm putting you on the spot, but you don't have, I mean, you want to walk us through it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's more. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you, I mean. So, uh, it's on now. So the, the presentation that is here, and I apologize for not getting this to you earlier, mainly because I was trying to make sure that I spoke to every individual assessor and made sure I had the right information for each jurisdiction. Um, so you know we are covered by Ossining, um, Village and Town, um, Newcastle, and Yorktown Heights. So I just wanted to make sure I spoke to them because um, I didn't know that we were presenting this um, today, which is not a big deal, but um, I just wanted to make sure the numbers are right because there were a lot of questions during the last meeting, which was a while ago. Um, so this is an overview of the real property tax law that pertains to the exemption for incorporated volunteer fire company, fire department, or incorporated voluntary ambulance. Um, the eligi eligibility requirements is that they must reside in the city, town, or village, serviced by the incorporated volunteer fire company, fire department, or incorporated volunteer ambulance service. Number two, the property must be primary residence. It cannot be 
um, uh, commercial um, or a rental. Number three, the property must be used exclusively for residential purposes. Again, it can't be used for commercial. Uh, number four, the volunteer must be certified by the authority having jurisdiction over the incorporated volunteer fire company. Now, I know this came up as one of the questions. Um, so what was added to this deck was a Q&A based on some of the um, questions that came back from members of the board. So um, in order to um, determine what our next steps are going to be, there's some decisions that the board has to make. First of all, it has to determine what the minimum years of service um, for eligibility would be. Um, it would be between two and five years of service. Uh, we would have to determine the procedure by which it certifies members years of service. And I, that's typically done through the assessor's office on an annual basis. Um, until you become permanent after 20 years, then you don't have to continue to apply for the exemption. Um, we also need to, to determine the par partial exemption amount, um, that which cannot exceed 10% of their assessed value of their residence. Um, decide if we'll offer a lifetime exemption of the 10% to be eligible for members with 20, year, 20 or more years of service. Um, so as long so long as their primary members primary residence is located with us in, within the same county and finally the board needs to determine if it will authorize um, an unmarried an unremarried spouse to maintain the exemption or may reinstate a pre-existing -exist exemption claimed by the enrolled member prior to his or her death if a volunteer firefighter or volunteer ambulance um, person is killed in the line of duty. So this is a page that I went back to check to make sure that I had the proper information. I know there was questions surrounding this. Um, again, with regard to arsoning, the number I had up here before with eligible parcels was 85. And speaking to um, Dave, the new uh, assessor, he explained to me that the 85 represented all of the fire exemptions. There's another fire, set of a fire exemption that is by dollar amount. The fire exemption that we're talking about um, and considering is by percentage. So this number dropped from 85 to 63. Um, there are, uh, are 8,000 taxable parcels in arsoning, totaling 4.5 billion in assessed value. So when you look at the $63,000 um, $63, um, of exempt um, value because 63 times 10% um, is going to get you to that $63,000. Um, and then you're backing out the um, taxpayers, which is $7,040 from the $8,000. You're backing out those that are exempt. The impact for taxpayers in Austin is $9 per year. In Yorktown Heights, I reconfirmed that there are no eligible parcels in OFS, OUFSD. There are in the Lakeland and Yorktown school districts, but not in ours. Um, there are 61 of those. And in North Castle, um, there's about 51,300 um, in, in assessed value properties. Um, that are el eligible for the 10% um, exemption. So the exemption amount under those circumstances would be 63,339. And if you divide it by the 625 parcels in the town of Newcastle, the cost to individual tax parcels or payers is $10.14 per year for school tax. So some of the questions that came up is, um, is there a minimum amount of time a person must commit in order to take advantage of the benefit? Uh, the, authority ha the authority having jurisdiction over the incorporated volunteer company and administering certification standards is either the Board of Commissions, um, the Village Board of Trustee, and um, allows for the governing body of the 
taxing jurisdiction extending the benefit to the period of service between two and five years. The Board of Education can thus set this period of service requirement for purposes of a school tax exemption. However, unfortunately, as to the length of service among all taxing juris jur jurisdictions is advised. Okay, so um, what that means is that we have the uh, school board makes a determination as to how long um, the person has to be um, a firefighter um, to start the tax, tax exemption. It could start at two years or it could start at five years or somewhere, somewhere there in between. But it's up to the school district to make that determination. Um, and what is advised by our legal counsel is that we should try to stay uniform with the um, other jurists, the other municipalities. So um, I believe that I know that the village of Ossining and the town of Ossining um, and the other municipalities and the other jurisdictions are um, at five years and at 10%. They haven't gone below that. So the statute does not provide a leeway to set a, le a limit under either the deceased member, spousal exemption, or, or killed in the line of duty spousal exemption. The unremarried spouse would hold the exemption until remarried. And there's other circumstances that relate to this type of exemption, again, for the unmarried spouse. Um, but there's the, what the school district can do is very limited with regard to the lifetime exemption um, provided to the spouse who never marries. So there's no other authority that the Board of Education has outside of what's outlined in the law related to um, unmarried um, surviving spouses. So there was also a question about the number of parcels in the previous slides and whether or not that represented two years of service or five. Um, right now, um, we can't um, say for certain, according to the assessor, he'll get back to us and look into it, um, as to when these firefighters came on board, either after two years of service or after five. Um, so yes, the, the financial impact on the slides that I showed you before, assume a 10% assessed value exemption. So all of those numbers assume a 10% value exemption. We are not, or the town assessor is not aware of a median number. He'd have to do some research and get back to the school district. Um, Now, would any, time, any, would any lifetime exemptions apply retroactively? If yes, do we know how many already retired volunteers with 20 years reside in Ossining, and is this incorporated into the figures presented? It includes all, um, all um, exemptions. After 20 years, again, they are not required to renew. Um, so, but it does include those that are at above 20 years and those are below. Anything below, again, 20 years, they are required to renew. And the, um, the um, assessor reaches out to the fire department and gets that information. That is not something the school district would do. So a question was, would households who live and volunteer in neighboring com communities but pay Austin school taxes be impacted. For example, a Newcastle resident who volunteers for the Newcastle Fire Department but resides within Austin school district borders. So the answer is yes. If the exemption is extended, it applies to all properties and volunteer firefighter ambulance worker um, owners that are eligible. So if they're in Ossining School District, they would be eligible <laughs> no matter where they live, if that was the intent of the question. Do we know what other municipalities in our area have acted on thus far? 
So the exemption is um, applicable to Westchester County taxes and the town and village of Ossining taxes. They adopted two years of service and a 10% um, exemption amount. So again, looking at the dates for the taxable status um, filing um, deadline, which is May 1st, 2024, we need to um, be in the um, in the in the um, area or somewhere near um, the March 13th board meeting. It certainly decision can be made before that, um, but I would think that that would be the latest as far as meetings go, um, so people understand um, the impact and what's happening before we take an official um, vote. Um, before the board takes an official vote. I shared with everyone um, the resolution that's recommended by our council, and it basically um, has fill in the blanks for those areas that the board has the um, decision to make or you know the option to make. Um, it, it has to be made, but it's this optional where you see those blanks as to whether or not we want to include it. Um, so, Um, the, first, the next step is just to determine if the board is in fact considering offering the exemption. Um, if we do determine that or if the board determines that, we have to determine the ex exemption limits up to 10%. It can't be above 10%. We have to determine the minimum years of service between two and five years. We have to determine if we're going to allow a lifetime eligibility and we also have to determine whether or not we're going to allow um, the unmarried spouse of a volunteer, firefighter, or ambulance worker killed in the line of duty to be provided the exemption after their passing, as long as they're not remarried. We have to hold a public hearing, and again, we have to notify the assessor's office prior to May 1st, 2024. So that's the end of it. I don't have any additional data. Um, like I said, it's not as exciting as the elementary <laughs> principal's presentation. I'm certainly not excited with it. Um, but I do want to seriously um, provide as much information for the board to make a decision and um, provide information for those of us, for those of those community members that are looking to see what needs to happen. Um, in order for the board to make a decision. Thank you, Alita. You're I appreciate welcome. it. I know you weren't expecting to come up and like represent everything. Oh, okay. again, so thank you. Um, so uh, since we last talked about this in July, the village and town slash town approved basically what was most favorable for the firefighters and ambulance workers, um, a 10 percent, um, 20 year lifetime, um, and with uh, two years of service requirement. But before we dig into the details there, we need to kind of decide as a board if we're interested in doing this at all. So I'd like to open it up for the board, um, to the board to discuss kind of a temperature check on where we are with this in general. Can I ask a question first? Um, just Alita, could you help me understand on just the taxpayer impact slide? The, I get the 63,000 but the divided by the 70 40 I'm, I'm not getting that part of it so the 7 70 40 excludes the 63 parcels but, but it, so originally it was 8,000 taxable parcels but in order to determine what the impact is for the those that are not exempt you have to use you have to subtract the 63 the 63 parcels from the 8,000 parcels. But that wouldn't be 70, 40, would it? That would be 700, 900, uh, 70, 900 and 30 something parcels, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's a typo. Okay. Sorry. So I, I think at the number, that. The number, um, the number is still the same though. I, the I number is still the same. I okay, it's a typo to, in the number. Okay. I did speak to the assessor. I just typed it in the room. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, no, just I mean for the sake of completeness, we should just put it, you know, correct it, that's all. Um, that's the only question I had, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, 
I, I also want to ask a question, and I'll give you my, my two cents um, on this one. Um, I'll leave just a curiosity. You have in there that the all of the uh, uh, municipalities, does a municipality include the village of Briarcliff Manor, or they are not included in there? Because I know the town of Austining could oftentimes just mean the town of Austining, um, excluding the Briarcliff Manor um, uh, municipality. Is that included? This, this, anything that's here, basically these are the three jurisdictions. So yes, there is a portion of Briarcliff that's part of these three jur jurisdictions. I believe the Austining assessor takes into account Briarcliff. Um, so he is responsible for Austining School District to tell us information about Briarcliff um, homes that are part of Austining Union Free School District. But that would only be the school portion of it that the, uh, that, that would be, because I think there's the village portion of it that's a very different. Yeah, we, we're not like. Because we, that, that's, so if somebody, you know, lives in that part of um, the school district, and they, or let's just say somebody lives in the village of, uh, of Austining, they get the, and say this is passed, for example, they get the, they get both the school and the, the village portion of that 10% <coughs> given as a credit against their property taxes, correct? Yes. Okay, but if you live in the village of Briarcliff, uh, Austining um, School District, you'll only get, because that's what the, the town assessor will have, because the town of Austin does not have jurisdiction over the village of Briarcliff tax, uh, in taxes. That's a different, it's something different. It's not It's not the same for collecting the, the, in that same way for allocating that. So can we just get um, clarification on that? That's, you know, just to make sure that that is the case, because then at least if there's uniformity, across all the municipalities that that's that would be the case because there are a good number of homes that are in that district in that part of the district yeah I again I sat on the phone this afternoon with Mike and he was very clear in selecting the homes that were in Austin and Union Free School District and those homes are included in this calculation of 8,000 taxable parcels and of those taxable parcels, 63 eligible. I understood, I think where I'm getting at, I, I totally get that those are the homes that are in there, but we've got facts in here that says that all of the municipalities have signed on. You've got the village of Austin, you've got the town of Austin, and the town has both two villages in there and an unincorporated section, but that's, you know, I get that, but then there's the village of Briarcliff, is that included in there? That, if we could just get cl a clarification, because we're gonna include that and say that all the municipalities are included in there, we make sure that that is clear, all the municipalities are really included in there. It's just, I just that's just a double check point in there. Um, but- Can I ask a question on that, Roger? So if a municipality doesn't do it, uh, like I thought we saw in the presentation that just the town of Austin and the village of Austin passed this. Like I don't know what the town of Yorktown's done, I don't know what the town of Newcastle's done, and I don't know what the village of Barclay's done. It, but I'm not sure how that relates to the school tax question before us. Like I'm, if they I'm decide just, to I'm pass just it curious or not, because you want to know factually did they do it or not? Well, it's I'm just looking at what's written up here, right? So that all the municipalities. So I'm just asking the question: What does that mean? All the municipalities. That's what was written. I, I put. So the, I asked the question. I put the Westchester mm -hmm. County and the town and village of Austin. I didn't put all. Okay. When well, I mean, then what I understood was. It, and I don't know if it was in this slide, if it was in a previous slide, but there were, it, that's why I was just asking the question. And, you know, it's fine. I just want to get just a sense of that because if the town and the village are, are doing something and that's part of the fact, fact sheet that's going to go in there, is that, you know, what is the net impact? So if, if I'm a firefighter, which I'm not, but if I'm a firefighter, I'm looking at this entire thing and trying to look at what, what's it mean to me, right? So that, that's all I'm just asking. We're just making sure that, you know, whatever we list in the facts here, that we just make sure that it has the completeness in there. That's all I'm asking for. You know, it doesn't matter to me what village, what town, just, you know, just a matter of if it's all, it's all. If it's not all, it's not all. Um, but I'm, I'm in support of this, so that's just so. Uh, Trustee Malstein, did you Yeah, really quick. I, so I support this. The question I had, um, 
Alita on that that nine dollars and ten dollars and fourteen cents. Does that stay the same for the the length of the exemption, or could it go from nine to nine fifty to ten? Yeah, your assessed value changes every year. The assessed right, right, so it could change best on the assessed value. Yeah, it's based on assessed value. And then, so would we, if we approve this, would we need to publicly say, well, in year one it's nine and ten fourteen, and year two it's no, going to go nine fifteen? No, we don't no. definitely want to go down that path. Okay. There's reasons why, obviously, assessments change. It could be based on the fact that you have built. Um, a new wing on your house. Um, so there's no definitive way that we can determine what the amount is going to be um, based on changes in assessed value. Um, we also make that point when we do our budget. In the budget book, it clearly says that the district is only responsible for the tax levy. That's the only thing that we're responsible for. How, did, how they get to the, what they actually pay is based on um, how the rate is determined um, which is the rate is determined based on the three jurisdictions splitting the levy, um, the equalized rate, um, equalization rate, and then finally um, the tax levy. So we, the only thing that the school district is in control of is the tax levy that is approved by the voters, um, and which is a budget amount. Um, and we have to get to that budget amount with a tax levy. Um, so actually, the school district, um, the voters do not vote on the levy itself, the tax levy. They vote on the budget. And the school district, my office, has to determine how we get to that budget and how much levy um, has to, there has to be as far as taxes go. Um, because not only tax levy accounts for the revenue for the budget, state aid as well. And in this, in this instance, the only thing that the school district <coughs> is responsible for is the things that need to be determined within the resolution itself where there are options. And there are, there are limitations on some of those options. And then that's it. We don't get involved with how much it costs other taxpayers, um, only except for me trying to do a projection, which is done here. Um, but certainly, it can go up um, because your assessed value may go up. Um, but it could also go down if we have more assessed value on the tax rolls. It also yeah. could change with membership changes within these organizations, right. right, which is a wild card. Right. I just So if there's needs, I guess I saw there needs to be a public hearing on this. I think that's just one key thing to let the public know that on year one, it will be that. But estimated. It, estimated. Estimated. Yeah. But it could fluctuate based on all these things, just so they know. But again, I, 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 I'm in support of this. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, anyone else? Just taking a temperature. Are we interested in doing this at all? And then we can kind of get into the weeds about what we want to offer as far as the filling in the blanks go. Yes, I'm interested. Trustee Banta, Schnecker. We should proceed with the hearing, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. No? I'm, I'm in I'm support. Just, I'm just, I'm asking if you're supportive of this in general, if you want to go down the path. Okay. Um, so that's a step in the right direction or a direction of progress there. Um, I had one question, and Alita, you may not have the answer to this, but um, I was just looking at the tax exemption that was passed for the village. <coughs> and... They have a section for unremarried spouse of enrolled member killed in the line of duty, which I saw that we also have to make a decision about, but then they also have one that just says unremarried spouse of deceased enrolled member with no mention of being um, killed in the line of duty. And that was new information to me, so I don't know if we also have to make a decision about that. I wasn't able to access um, whatever files you sent earlier this okay, afternoon. Okay, so I'll, I'll resend it. Um, I'll resend what our attorneys gave us. Okay. And where they said that we have to make choices. Okay. Um, all right, should we leave it there? Or do we want to go further into this at all right now? Can I ask one clarifying question? Of it course. It does not have to be answered tonight. Um, I think I asked this last time too, but I, and I may have missed it. I apologize if so. Um, so my question is on the lifetime exemption. It says... That, it's, that it applies as long as they still reside in the same county. So if a volunteer moves to Bedford, 
would austening still be required to provide the lifetime exemption even though the property is not in austening? I believe that was the answer that we got, but that, that's confusing to me too, to be honest. Um, the response, I believe, came from our attorney that I provided. Um, it was in that Q&A, because I did look, seek an, a response for that. But let me circle back around with them um, to make sure that I understand it, because if there's a lifetime exemption, why would they have to use austenings if they're moving to Bedford? I just don't understand that piece. So let me circle back. But I did, that, that, that was the question was yes. Um, that is based, they can get the lifetime um, exemption as long as they live in Westchester County. So um, Austin but residents would be paying for Yeah, I'm not sure. I, yeah, let me circle okay. back. Let yeah, me circle I, I suspect back. it's more likely that if you were to move from Bedford into Austin and you were a volunteer firefighter in Bedford for a number of years, that you'd be exemption for that in Austin. That's where we wouldn't be paying to Bedford, but I think that's what we should confirm with the council. Okay. I wasn't clear in the... Yeah, I think you take that exemption with you. If you move into another location in the county, then you're exempt from their school tax. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on. Um, this is our next agenda item is audience recognition. But seeing that we have no one here left in the audience with us, we can move ahead to uh, the consent agenda all right. Let me just make sure I'm looking at the right thing here. Oh, okay. Is there anyone, anyone wishes to break out from 4.1 or 4.2? Okay. I'll take a motion for 4.1 and 4.2. So moved. I, I just have a question about 4.2. Is that part of the motion? I'll ask for uh, questions after. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so can I get a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? Take it away, Trustee Melcy. <laughs> uh, just really quick on 4-2, just, just to clarify um, the need for the additional DASA coordinator. Is that because we have a lot of DASA um, paperwork, or what, what's the sort of the reasoning behind it? I'm just curious. Each house. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So each, there's four houses? Yes. Okay, and we have, so we have three DASA coordinators, right. and we need one. Okay. That yeah. makes four, yeah, right? That makes one, four. two, three, four. Okay. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> Abstentions. All right. Um, now, 5.1 through 5.4, we need to kind of um, break apart and take separately here. Um, Alita, you had wanted to rescind 5.1 through 5.3. That's correct. Okay. Um, I'll take a motion to rescind 5.1 through 5.3. So moved. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's, it's being rescinded or, because it wasn't approved. Okay. I wanted to remove it from the agenda. So um, for 5.1 and 5.2, yeah, right? It was never, if we're rescinding it, that means it was approved. It was never approved. So we're, we're tabling it. We're tabling it. Okay. 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 Uh, so a motion to table 5.1 and, and 5.2 and then rescind 5.3, right? Correct. Okay. So a motion to table 5.1 and 5.2. Don't move. Second. All in favor, or any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, opposed? Abstentions. Now I'll take a motion to rescind 5.3. Any discussion, or yes, I'll have to take a motion. Somebody second it. <laughs> second. Thank you. Here we go. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? abstentions. Okay. I, I was an I. I don't think I said it on time. Well, thanks. <laughs> All right. So now we need a, uh, I'll take a motion. I, I forgot to read them. I'm sorry. Um, I'll take a motion for 5.4 through 5.8. Okay. Um, I forgot to read them before, but I'll read them now since I had can rectify that mistake. All right, resolution regarding appropriating funds to the Capital Reserve Facilities Improvement Program 2022. 
5.5, resolution to accept New York State Education Media Technology Grant. 5.6, resolution to accept funds for driver education program fall 2023 to 2024. 5.7, resolution regarding uh, board of 2023-2024 printing bid. 5.8, resolution regarding interfund transfers. Any discussion? Yes, quickly. Sure. So this is not necessarily for this meeting, um, but I guess the question is for you, Alita. Just being new here, I just wanted to, maybe there's an opportunity to get like training. I don't know if it's in the NISBA financial governance training, but I'm just curious like, okay, when we need a bid out on something, what do we do? What are required? How do we get bids? Like for instance, in this one, I didn't see, for example, in 5.7 on the printing, like SBS, Postal Center, like their local businesses. So I just wanted to maybe get some training on that. Maybe some other board members would be interested too. And then like, we're not talking about five, nine, but when we go through that list of here's what we just did and paid out again, I'd love to get some training to understand how that's decided. Is that part of the budget process? Um, but because again, I just, because I want to read all this and understand it. Uh, and admittedly, I, I, I don't feel I'm up to speed on it. And so not for this meeting, but I'm just wondering if this is actual Did you say right? additional training, Trustee Mills? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did. I did on this so I can understand what I'm looking at. Absolutely, yes. So just, just briefly, and I, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail yeah. or much detail. Um, the resolution related to um, the bidding is based on our purchasing regulations and law and also general municipal law. Um, so there are certain thresholds at which you have to bid, and there's a newspaper that has been selected by the board for solicitation of bids. And that happens in um, um, the reorg. We select the, and it's actually part of board policy. So those organizations need to look at those papers um, to see if there's anything that they're wanting to bid on. Um, and then finally, 5.9 is just for information only because the internal claims auditor, um, when we make payments, they check all of those things. They make sure that the payments are made within budget, like we have the budget for it. They make sure that the contracts are in place. They make sure that purchasing rules and regulations are followed. Um, so all of that stuff, there's another, there's another claims process. There's another... Um, auditing process every time we make a payment um, to anyone. Okay, so yeah, I agree with Trustee uh, Banta on this. So like back to the, the bidding process, if we're just putting something out in a newspaper and a local business, if they don't happen, or any business doesn't happen to be scanning or pick up a newspaper, they may miss the opportunity potentially to bid, like I just don't know, like do we put it out on digital platforms? Do we put it on signage? Again, it doesn't have to be discussed in this meeting because it's a broader discussion, but I certainly would be interested to understand that uh, to make sure we're getting the best bids and you know having the community involved and all that. So, so uh, <laughs> we can't change that right now um, unless we change the policy. Um, but what it does is it establishes a, um, a, a, a a minimum. So this at minimum is where you should look because we as a school district cannot just select different mediums of, um, of um, advertising. We need to make sure that everybody knows, like for example, our construction companies that handle the bids for con um, construction projects know to go, know where to go. But certainly we do reach out to local companies based on the them being vendors in the past. Um, so we do do that as well. Um, there are opportunities that we can look at um, to increase bid participation. Um, but for these type of bids, they're kind of small um, and there's not a lot of interest. So that would, that would be board policy to say newspaper plus? Whatever. No, again, you, the board policy is setting like the bar, like you have to do this but it does not prevent us from doing that. Okay, thank you. All right, we've and you'll get training on the financial piece and that'll be covered in your financial training with the claims auditors. Yeah. I'm halfway through it, I'm not finished yet. So <laughs> or at least in the in-person in training they did that. I don't know about the, if you're doing it online what they're gonna do, it'll probably be a little different. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a motion on the floor so I'll take the vote. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Is there anything anyone wishes to break out from 6.1 through 6.12? general question and I go ahead okay <laughs> I'll take a motion for uh, 6.1 through 6.12 so move second 6.1 resolution move. regarding support staff resignations 6.2 resolution regarding professional staff appointments 6.3 resolution regarding civil service staff appointments 6.4 resolution regarding support staff appointments 6.5 resolution regarding bus attendant appointments 6.6, .6, resolution regarding professional staff appointments, summer school programs. 6.7, resolution regarding professional staff appointments before slash after school programs. 6.8, resolution regarding civil service staff appointments before slash after school programs. 6.9, resolution regarding support staff appointments before slash after school programs. 6.10, resolution regarding per diem substitute appointments. 6.11, resolution regarding APPR accountability. 6.12 resolution regarding approval of school volunteers. Any discussion? How are, okay, so <laughs> I'm trying to think of like how I want to ask this question. Um, for example, bus attendant appointments. How do we decide what the pay for a bus attendant is? So um, 11 years ago, we used to use um, a different company, Bauman, um, and we were paying them um, for the use of their bus attendants that were their employees. Um, that would prove to be very expensive, so we changed that, and we started to hire our own um, bus attendants. Um, it worked well for a while, but obviously, you know, it's been hard to fill positions. Um, so we looked at, we had a consultant um, at the time we did a traffic study, and he gave us a sense of what the hourly rate should be at that time. So we've been increasing it annually based on similar percentages um, increased by um, other, other units as well as non-bargaining. Um, this group is not part of a unit, um, so we've been just slowly increasing them. But the base salary started um, when we moved from Bauman to our <coughs> own employees. Um, so that's how we got the number. Based on a consultant's recommendation. Okay. I don't know if this is an appropriate conversation to have right now or if we just need to talk about it another time, but um, I would like to talk about uh, just pay, basically, at some point. Okay. Um, you're right that now is not the time, but we can discuss that another time. Um, for now, uh, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right, on to board policies. Is there anything anyone wishes to break out from 7.1 through 7.4? I'll take a motion for 7.1 through 7.4. So moved. Second. 7.1, resolution to adopt new policy number 5162 and 5162R, student dismissal precautions, policy, and regulation as a first reading. 7.2, resolution to adopt policy 6600, fiscal accounting and reporting as a first reading. 7.3, resolution to adopt policy uh, number 7365, construction safety as a first reading. 7.4, resolution to adopt new policy 9350, staff request for accommodations under the American with Disabilities Act as amended ADAAA as a first reading. Let's discuss. Um, because I know the policy committee met and put um, a lot of thought into all of these, and so this will kind of roll into our, our policy update dealt with a lot of this stuff. Um, so we can take it one at a time, and then we can break it out if we need to as far as voting for stuff. Um, um, I can speak a little bit to the student dismissal precautions policy and regulation as a first reading. Basically, this came about from our building administrators. Um, there is no legal age of that you have to be in New York State to supervise a sibling, let's say, or babysit. But um, we had in practice um, required that a, somebody picking up a student from Park School be 16 years old and somebody picking up a Brookside student to be um, 14 years old, and that would have been at some point a decision made by 
building principles in the past. It's kind of been past practice, but we didn't have anything in policy, and they felt that they um, needed a policy to point to in order to do that. Um, when we met as a policy committee, we asked, you know, what's legal? And Alita took it to, to legal and said, you, sh you should codify basically whatever you are already doing as current practice. So that's what this is. If anybody from the policy committee has anything to add to that or if anyone would like to discuss that. Can I ask a, just a question? Sure. Um, does this only apply to being picked up at school? Like not bus or anything? I believe it also does include bus drop off. Okay. It, I, as far as I understood, it was also pick up at the bus stop. I think when they're running into the issues, when they're checking IDs in the building, um, I think that's where it came up. But the, as the policy is written, it also applies to bus dismissal. Okay, so it would be required for bus pickup to also have IDs checked. I don't think that they check for bus pickup. Like when the bus picks up in the morning, Yeah. Um, I don't think that they check IDs as long as the child's there, they live on the bus. Yeah, I mean, like, I brought this up last week that, like, a park, stu a park student parent told me that their neighbor was able to get the child off the bus and, like, that helped the parent out in the moment, but the bus driver didn't know who the, pa the neighbor was. It right, was just, like, and a that, random that is not in al alignment with our policy okay. as it existed already and as this policy would also exist. Okay. Um, Sorry, I don't mean to get too into the weeds with this, but it was, it's, you know, it's a safety issue. Of course, yes, and, but that would, that would not have been in a compliance with this policy. Right, and that's dismissal, what you're describing. Um, that's part of the, this, this, this process, um, okay. this policy, dismissal. So if something like that happens, then we need to know, or um, Jim needs to know to address it. Okay. Yeah, that should not be happening. Right, and this policy is specific for dismissal from school, like going into the building to obtain a child, not... So that was my question originally. No, I, I, I thought it included I don't, bus. I don't Let's believe take a look this is... The way that I read it, it sounded like it was only for going in school, mm -hmm. so that's why I was curious if it mm -hmm. also was for picking yeah, up Yeah, this is not transportation bus. related per se. I yeah. know, I think you probably... Uh, um, Remembering that we had, a, we had we had a separate, separate conversation yes, you're right. around, uh, you're yeah. right. Actually, but it's not right. this policy. This you're is right. specifically in the building releasing children. Yes, you're right. We did have a separate conversation. And um, then my questions do not apply. <laughs> yeah, I think Melissa's right. Thank you. And there's also the um, added, I guess, um, leeway, if you will, for the principal to use their discretion for extenuating circumstances um, to, you know, have their own discretion for that situation, right? The emergency happens, you have to send an older sibling there, you know. Yes, so. we, we were deliberate about making sure that there was a caveat there in the case of an emergency that an exception could be made at the discretion of the building principal. Um, then we have, if, if there's nothing else on that one, um, fiscal accounting and reporting as a first read um, this actually doesn't talk a little bit about the RFP process. <laughs> I, um, can, I can describe. I, I yeah. can describe what's being um, modified here. Um, so, unfortunately, there uh, being a small school district um, with regards to staffing in the business office, um, <laughs> when there are there are unexpected changes in personnel, sometimes things slip. Um, through the cracks. So with regard to, Robert, your question about this warrant and what does it do, the internal auditor, internal claims auditor comes to the school district and looks at all of the payments that we are wanting to pay. So there was this one instance um, where we were looking for the original invoice for electricity at 400 exact from um, the um, service provider. It took us a while to locate it, number one. Um, number two, we did get them to waive the late fees because we never want to have a late fee. We've never been late. But number three, what this does, it allows the um, internal claims auditor to approve it after the payment has been made. So for any utility um, that needs to be paid, we can go ahead and pay it. Um, and don't have to wait until they approve it. 
um, they will review it to make sure the claim is appropriate, um, but we need to pay it to make sure that the lights are on. So they suggested this language, which comes directly from the controller's office. All right. Um, speaking to the next policy, construction safety. Um, at the policy committee felt it um, pertinent to, this would be a new policy, to instate a policy with hopefully um, lots of construction projects happening soon. Um, to basically reiterate safety proto uh, protocols that are taking place that we already engage in. So this would be another uh, policy codifying uh, what is already our practice. Um, this is canned, a canned uh, policy with the exception of a few things. I believe um, Jared Mance made some edits that make it a little bit more practical for austining. One was that the um, Health and Safety Committee uh, engaged in a walkthrough uh, as part of the completion process for um, construction projects and that can be not practical when so often construction projects complete late August and it's not really possible to convene the entire board. So um, he just tweaked it to say as many um, committee members as practical and I think that that was the only change that he made if I recall. Um, any discussion on that? I just have a comment. It seems, I think, the two-month notice about the work, it, based on past experience, is going to be problematic at times. I think I would give more flexibility than the two months. I, I would give a lesser time period. Like, I think you should give a notice, but I think two months, sometimes projects get approved and you got to move quickly, and you'd have a hard time, I think, unless, Alita, I'm off base on this one. I'm sorry, we did have a discussion. Do you, can you tell me what line number? So I'm talking about pre-construction number four. So it's on the first page, pre-construction number four, and it's provide notice to parents, staff, and the community in advance of any construction projects costing 10,000 or more in an occupied school building, and the, not the notice to be two months prior to the date. I, I agree. I agree. I thought we discussed this. We, we discussed the ten thousand dollar. I think. I don't think we that's a pretty low threshold for a construction right. project. And then I think two months' notice for a project like that. I think you've got to shorten that time frame down, or at least I'd want to get more. Conf I'd like to get hear back from the administration that they're okay with that. I, I, I would agree with that. I think we should probably have a further discussion on that because I think that that itself could be problematic for you know, when we do any kind of future work. So it's a conversation to be had that maybe we're not, that before we really vote on this for a, a first read. Okay. Yeah, this is for projects that are being conducted while school is in session. Mm -hmm. um, so it does provide for emergency conditions and it not being um, two months in advance. But right. I'm just thinking of changes. I completely agree with changing this to a lower threshold. I'm just thinking of like that third floor connector at the exactly. high school That's is one of these right. that would come up and it really wasn't an emergency project, right. but it was a project. And so I thought what, we, just sorry, I thought as we, we take this back to the policy committee, what seems reasonable? I think we should ask the administration. That. Okay. Well, I, get your, uh, I, I think like a two weeks notice to families in my mind would be fine, but that's something to, to get their input on. Okay. I would agree with that. Okay. And then uh, the last policy to discuss here is staff request for accommodations under the American with Disabilities Act. Um, this policy reiterates laws that we're already bound to follow. Um, Doug Berry took a look at it and said that if he were to come up with one himself, he would write one that looks basically exactly like this. Uh, the only change he made was to insert the um, Na title of that role, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, within the policy, um, as it suits our, you know the roles that we have in our district. Um, any? Okay. I, I just, just, just can we just go really quickly back to seven one for a second sure. on the dismissal? So I, I, you know, just just to. For Annie's point, is, are we saying that the dismissal for buses 
when the student left off, taking the, you know, goes to a bus stop, that that is codified in policy here? Is it required to be? Because I just did a quick look under the word bus. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the best word to search. And I didn't see anything that says, now, at a bus stop, a student can only be picked up by blank, by bike, bike. So if it is codified and I'm missing it, totally fine. If we don't need to codify it, totally fine. But just want to make sure that if we're having the same standard for the pickup of the school, probably should be the same standard for the bus. Okay, so um, I, I don't think that would be the case because now I'm, I'm trying to recollect what happens is that a certain age group has to have a guardian somewhere there to pick that child up. And I don't know what the threshold for that age group is. Um, so the bus driver would not drop off a child. If they're, for example, um, a kindergartner, mm -hmm. they're not gonna just drop them off if nobody's there to pick them up. So what happens is they do look at the ID during the first couple of weeks of school, and then they start to get familiar with the person. Um, but they would not leave a child unaccompanied at a certain age at the bus stop. After that certain age, like, um, I'm, I don't know the I number. I think it's Claremont. Huh? I think it's Claremont. Claremont. It's grade Claremont. three. Claremont, okay. So, <laughs> so then after that, then they could let the child go home. But I so, think... Go ahead. Without so, somebody being there right. to walk them home. Right. So that's why this the policy would only uh, like apply to Brookside and... Um, park for that reason. But I think the question is, what if, okay, what if I'm a Brookside parent and I, on my sheet of approved people to pick up from the bus, include a 12 year old, this I, I, policy I, wouldn't, I don't think uh, this policy wouldn't address that. This would only apply to building pickups. At the school. And this, this policy is specific to the building. It right. says that clearly right. in the policy. We did, we did have does it? I guess I, I have a question you around that. From the parents' oh. perspective, the transportation department has their rules regarding pickup. I believe it's 14 because I was upset my 13-year-old couldn't do it. Okay. I would just. But I think it's an issue to address with transportation. I think we need to get a clarification of what it means to be released from school. My understanding is, is the students are in school from the moment they get onto the bus until they get off the bus. So if I read the first sentence in this and it says they cannot be released from school, I, I, I would interpret that as the bus, including the bus. But I think it's a question for council, I guess, in that regard, if this is the same. And we should just know, probably know that it's covering both or it's not covering both. And maybe just even define what that means specifically so it's very clear. Uh, yeah, I don't know that we necessarily need to define it. I think it's probably defined for us, but for, for release from school, but well, if you're asking, right, so it's, it, then others could be asking the same question, right? Because then if you're saying it's from bus to bus, right, morning to, to, yeah, to I, drop off, then if there's nobody be there, the, same the student and comes, one, back to, comes back to the building, but right. they're still in school, right? So mm -hmm. I think it does require some clarification for that perspective. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah my point was so, exactly, yeah, that was the point. Like, it, right. if, if the, we have a policy and it's within the transportation department, but are we, we require to have it officially as part of a policy, potentially this one. That's what I was trying to get at. So, so this policy was specifically as um, this was meant to, to, to codify practices that were already in place for school release. And, Correct. And, I, and I guess, you know, maybe if you would like, we could clarify it further, but if you look the third paragraph from the bottom, if any individual seeks release from school of a student, he or she must report to the school office and prevent, pre present identification, you know, yada, yada. So it, it is specifically, and, and as you can see, this is in all red, which indicates this is a brand new policy. This one, 7.1 and 7.3 are brand new policies, which is why they're all in red. So this is basically cementing something that's already being done so that there's some consistency um, that the principals can use as guidance. That, that was the conversation that we kind of had when we started this, reviewing this policy. Um, so if there's a desire to implement stuff in here or, 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 or consult with Jim about what that would look like for transportation, we can. But this policy was not intended for transportation. So is the, is the ask that this a, another exploration of a transportation-based policy be explored, 
or whatever our policies are around transportation. You mean the bus stop? Uh, um, well, bus stop. Yeah. So I, I'm just I'm just going to say one thing, and we can um, rely on attorneys, but it's not the school district's responsibility as to once that child gets off the bus, it's the parent's responsibility. So I know that's what the attorney is going to tell us. So I would be um, skeptical and, and, and worrisome about setting a policy that we don't have to set and putting more liability on the school district. So it's the parent's responsibility from the moment they get off the bus to the stop and the moment they get to the stop on the bus. It's not the school district's responsibility. Certainly we would not drop off a child, um, a, a kindergartner who there's nobody there for them. Um, but we don't want to start putting um, policies and, and, and on the school district that do not need to exist and create more liability for ourselves. Right, and I just wonder, does this first sentence kind of, could somebody interpret it differently and, and hold us liable saying really as a release from school? So I, I think that should be clarified, right? If it's really gonna so, be for buildings, then let's make sure it's clear there, right? Right, so all you're looking to see, Frank, if I'm just to clarify your feelings here, would be no student may be released from a school building to anyone or? I, I think I'm asking for <laughs> what is the common practice and can we have two different policies for when somebody picks up versus somebody meets at a bus? And should we have two different policies? And those are fair, and for the reasons that Alita says, maybe we, that is a good idea from a liability standpoint, but is it also permissible to have two different policies for that? Okay. Yeah, and then so exactly that. Right. So, so can we vote on this thing now or do we think we need to table it until we get that answer? It sounds, I'm hearing yeah, that well, we, that's need, to the point of the we first need to table to see it. If you have more questions or concerns, yeah. we take it back. Okay, so um, I'm hearing, tell me if I'm wrong here, that we would like to, um, Table 7.1 and 7.3, right? That sounds right? Okay. We've got a motion on the floor for 7.1 yeah. and 7.4. Can I just, I'll, I'll rescind that motion. <laughs> I'll make a new motion. You need to put that to a vote. I'd like to take a motion to rescind 7.1 through 7.4. So moved. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. 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 Oppo opposed? Abstentions. Okay, I'll take a motion to table 7.1 resolution to adopt new policy uh, number 5162 and 5162 R student dismissal precautions policy and regulation as a first reading and 7.3 resolution to adopt new policy number 7365 construction safety as a first reading. So moved. So moved. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> Abstentions. All right, now I'll take a resolution for uh, 7.2, resolution to adopt policy number 6600, fiscal accounting and reporting as a first reading, and 7.4, resolution to adopt new policy number 9350, staff request for accommodations under the American with Disabilities Act as amended as a first reading. So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? All right, um, eight is audience recognition. Again, seeing that we have none here, um, we can move ahead to board reports and dialogue. Do we, what do we, did we? Did I, did I miss 7. something? 7.3, did we table it or did, did I miss something? I might have. Yeah, we tabled Okay, seven. I thought it got, got put together with 7.1. I, I grouped okay. them together, I did right. two and two. Just wanted to make sure. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, board reports and dialogue, anybody? I know policy committee just met, but we just kind of discussed everything that the policy committee had done. So. I just wanted to encourage trustees to finish their board selfie val as soon as possible. Mary and I are using the results of the selfie val to finalize the agenda for the board retreat, which is coming up on the 18th. There is material to be circulated in advance of that. Um, so the sooner the better, guys. And thank you to those who have already done it. All right, no other committees met or anything? What did you say? Okay, okay. 
Yes, if any committees know. Let's go ahead then. Um, there being no further regular business of the board, I will take a motion to enter an executive session for the purposes of discussing uh, matters leading to the appointment, employment, employment, promotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right. 